Good afternoon. Today is February the 9th, 2022, and we are the Ways and Means Committee uh, assembled here on Zoom for our afternoon hearings. Uh, all the witnesses will have two minutes except for the sponsor and starting us off with uh, three individuals testifying, which includes herself, House Bill 405 and Delegate Lehman, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm sorry to have uh, preempted you at first. I apologize. Um, good afternoon, um, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and esteemed members of the Ways and Means Committee. I'm here to ask your favorable report of House Bill 405, which creates a claimable income tax credit um, for those who incur qualified expenses regarding the installation of what is referred to as mechanical insulation, kind of a mouthful. Um, so the bill would allow those who apply for an income tax credit if they have made a capital investment of $10,000 toward mechanical insulation. It would be on a first come first serve basis. And um, it would involve the distribution of $5 million per year in tax credit. So what is mechanical insulation? Well, it um, is the insulation that is installed wrapped around HVAC systems, and it serves three purposes. So that's for both heating and cooling. So first of all, it provides um, energy efficiency and longevity in the HVAC system. Um, and this is applied for purposes of this law to industrial and commercial buildings only. It cuts their business costs in the long term by reducing those energy costs and the wear and tear on those HVAC systems. It also creates incentives that will strengthen the mechanical insulation industry in Maryland. Um, and of course, it provides opportunities for Maryland workers. These are jobs that cannot be outsourced, obviously. Um, it also creates good sustainability practices because it reduces energy consumption and um, makes these buildings much more energy efficient for heating and cooling purposes. And of course, it means reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which impact global warming. So um, ultimately, ultimately, the bill will improve building standards uh, and good economic practices within Maryland, um, provide for better sustainability and create green jobs. You're gonna hear from some experts and a constituent uh, of mine about the advantages that this bill would create. I thank you for your consideration. And I do wanna point out that I have one technical amendment, um, a trade group known as ASHRA uh, pointed out that the standard that is uh, referenced in the bill, and this is on page two lines, um, two through five, are referencing an outdated standard from 2007. ASHRA periodically updates its standards and the most recent standard was updated in 2019. So that is a technical amendment to the bill, striking the 2007 reference and uh, substituting the 2019 reference. Uh, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Vice Chair and members of this committee, I thank you and I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Next, and I hope I say this correctly, Pete, I'm Lemony for two minutes. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Delegate Lehman for proposing this bill and the members of the Ways and Means Committee for the opportunity for my testimony of HB 405. My name is Pete Alomini. I am the Executive Director of the Insulators Labor Management Cooperative Trust. After completing an engineering degree, I have immersed myself in numerous positions in the mechanical insulation industry. I am more than qualified to testimony that my testimony is in favorable support of the Maryland Tax Incentive Bill, HB 405. The Maryland Tax Incentive would be a huge step to increase opportunities for Maryland and all the same time reducing harmful air pollutants. Mechanical insulation increases energy efficiency, reduces operating costs, and lowers the carbon footprint. There is no doubt that energy technology will lead us into a path of alternative fuels in the future, but we must be realistic and reasonable with a timeline of expectation. Dependency of fossil fuel will still be a large part use in commerce and transportation, but having it used efficiently is smart energy stewardship. Mechanical insulation is used in all buildings and incentives are needed to raise awareness of this ignored and misunderstood 
engineered science of mechanical insulation, underutilization and devaluing mechanical insulation and awareness of its benefits is unfortunately all too common. Please do not assume that building codes and other regulations such as ANSI ASHRAE standard 90.1 automatically incorporates proper monitoring and maintenance of mechanical insulation because it does not. This incentive tax bill will offer the awareness and will motivate the owners so they can quickly realize the benefits beyond the tax credit and also increase business and in lowering the carbon footprint. This is ultimately the result of offering more careers for the people of Maryland. There are approximately 2,500 insulators with a multitude of businesses that are associated with mechanical insulation. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts and recommendations for this particular important incentive. Please feel free to contact me and please look at the submitted documents that I submitted. Thank you for your allowing me to offer support of this bill. Thank you very much. Next, Brian Cavey for two minutes, please. Good afternoon, Chairperson Atterbury and Vice Chair Washington. Delegate Lehman, thank you for proposing this, uh, this legislation. And I see that you've learned a lot about insulation through our conversations. Members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about opportunities in mechanical insulation and what it can offer in energy efficiency and carbon emissions. My name is Brian Cavey. I'm business manager of Heat and Frost Insulators and Allied Workers Local 24. The building sector accounts for about 76% of electricity usage and 40% of all primary energy usage and associated greenhouse gas emissions in the US. Upwards of 30% of all commercial buildings have damaged or missing insulation. Sometimes insulation is part of the value engineering process when there's a need to lower original construction costs and that is done without regard for energy usage or energy costs that come later. During maintenance activities, insulation is often damaged and removed and then not replaced. The percentage that a building uses in energy is exponentially greater than the percentage of damaged or missing insulation. So in other words, say a building's missing 30% of insulation, that could result in a 50 to 60% waste of energy and emissions. So missing a little means a lot. There are options in the building sector when it comes to increasing energy efficiency but mechanical insulation offers an incredible return on investment with as little as six months on a heating system being fairly typical. Creation of work will retire the, require the need of an increased workforce, which in turn create not just jobs, but careers in the insulation industry, an industry that uses a Maryland State Registered Apprenticeship Program. Having an incentive to building owners to increase their efficiency and lower emissions is crucial and we urge a favorable report on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, with five seconds to spare. I like that. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for either the delegate or uh, her two witnesses? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 405. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, delegate Lehman, stay put. Uh, now I'm calling House Bill 457, uh, and I want everyone to know that when it comes time for questions, Daniel Roan is here from the Comptroller's Office if anyone has questions that they would like to address for, uh, to him as well. But whenever you're ready, uh, Delegate Lehman, please begin. Thank you again, uh, Madam Chair. Um, uh, for the record, I am Delegate Mary Lehman here to urge a favorable report of House Bill 457, the throwback rule and combined reporting. Um, enacting the throwback rule and combined reporting of corporate income will change how corporate income tax is calculated in Maryland. It will also provide a more accurate accounting of the profits of multi-state uh, corporations and what they are earning here in Maryland and activities. And it will add, um, and this is an updated fiscal note, $225 million annually to the state's coffers by FY 2027, that figure includes money for the Transportation Trust Fund, local highway user revenues, and the Higher Ed Investment Fund. Um, so many of you on this committee have heard the arguments regarding combined reporting for years, as well as the throwback rule, but I'm gonna briefly explain them both to refresh your memories. And for those, um, uh, including Chair Atterbury, who are new to this committee, 
So first, the throwback rule. Um, under the throwback rule, sales of rented and owned real property, intangible personal property, um, must be used to determine Maryland taxable income if that property is delivered or shipped to a purchaser in our state, regardless of the point of origin from where it was shipped, um, or if the property is shipped from a warehouse store or any other place within the state, and the corporation is not already taxable in the state of Maryland. So beginning in tax year 2022, this year and beyond, the throwback rule says that if a corporation with operations in Maryland has income not taxed by the state, um, by any state, I'm sorry, that income is quote unquote thrown back into the state of Maryland and taxed here. Combined reporting recognizes a multi-state parent company and its subsidiaries as one corporation for state tax income purposes. That would kick in in FY 2024, and it would establish that multi-state companies um, would report to the state income based on the amount of Maryland business they are conducting. Now, there is additional, um, a lot of additional information in my written testimony, as well as the fiscal impact analysis about all the details. What I do want to call to your attention is who is here and who is not today to speak in favor of this legislation. So first of all, I want to make it really clear. I am very grateful to the witnesses that are here to speak today. Um, and, and there are many, and there are many more that submitted written testimony. But I want to say something about an entity that's not here. There was a small business, a bakery based in Baltimore that testified on this legislation last year. And we contacted that business owner, uh, my staff, to come back this year. And he said, you know what? I don't think so. He said, I, I really appreciate it. It was an interesting experience last year. I felt like I was making a difference. I thought it was really exciting. And he's like, clearly nobody heard me. <laughs> nobody, you know, the, the, the bill didn't, you know, even move at all. And it's just really discouraging. I mean, I'm a small business doing everything I can to, you know, to survive here. And um, I just don't see the point. And, and even when we came back and said, because my intern came to me and said, oh, this is kind of discouraging. I said, well, let's encourage him anyway and tell him, you know, it, it can take years to pass good legislation. He still was not persuaded. Um, and so that made me say, you know what? I know these bills have been around a long time. How long have they been around? So we asked the legislative library. Well, it turns out these bills have been proposed consecutively every year since 2003. And there were probably efforts prior to 1996, only the legislative library could not get at those. They do know between 96 and 2002, there were no bills, but, but there is a history prior to 96. I was told that by a labor union that said they thought they had been supporting combined reporting in particular for 25 to 30 years. Um, so to wrap up, this is really a tax fairness issue. Um, combined reporting in particular puts uh, large multi-state uh, corporations on more equal footing with Maryland only businesses, the ones we refer to as mom and pop businesses. In 2020, combined reporting and the throwback rule both passed the full house as separate bills. This year, I'm putting forward the combined bill and I urge your favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All of the uh, following witnesses will have two minutes, beginning with Cecilia Plant, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you members of the committee for uh, hearing my testimony today. I am testifying in support of HB 457, and I do wanna thank Delegate Lehman for bringing this bill again, <laughs> um, and we are hoping that it passes this time. Um, our members, uh, of the Maryland Legislative Coalition, of which I'm the chair, uh, are very strong believers in making sure that everyone pays their fair share. And um, that's, that's basically the, one of the, the cruxes that, that this country was founded on, was taxation without rep representation was not an, a good thing. Um, so our members believe that there is no better time than the present to take a hard look at how Maryland receives revenue from taxes, specifically how skewed taxes are in favor of large corporations and away from low income earners. We all remember the giant federal tax giveaway that was passed in 2017. The idea, which we all understood to be false, was to trickle down the giant tax cuts for corporations to low and middle class earners. That never happened. Corporations turn those tax breaks into stock buybacks and bonuses for executives. 
And on top of all that, they still got breaks from Maryland. Giant multi-state corporations that made huge profits from the federal tax giveaway still managed to get around paying taxes for their subsidiaries in Maryland. This needs to end. This bill will take aim at two major loopholes for large corporations, combined reporting and the throwback rule. And I will not repeat what Delegate Lehman so uh, carefully laid out for you, um, but it is our belief that Maryland needs revenues to support its residents and small businesses who have suffered during the pandemic. We believe it's time for big corporations to step up and pay their fair share. And our 30,000 members are in very, very strong support of this bill. And we recommend a favorable reporting committee. Thank you. Next, Kevin Slayton, please, for two minutes. Or not, I don't see him in here. So we will circle back in case he appears. Uh, so Michael Mazarov. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Michael Mazarov, a senior fellow with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in DC. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of HB 457. My comments will be limited to combined reporting, but I strongly support the throwback rule as well. Combined reporting remains an essential tax policy reform for Maryland if it's to have a fair and robust corporate income tax. Year in and year out, the state suffers significant erosion of its corporate tax base because of corporate tax avoidance techniques that exploit the absence of combined reporting. There are several abusive tax avoidance strategies to which non-combined reporting states are vulnerable, and most of them can't be stopped at all through any other policy change than combined reporting. While Maryland has failed to act on this essential reform, many other states have moved ahead. At present, 28 states in the District of Columbia mandate combined reporting, including our deep red neighbor, West Virginia. Over the many years that adoption of combined reporting has been considered here, this committee has undoubtedly heard claims that it would discourage corporations from investing in the state in the future and perhaps even cause corporations already here to leave. There's no support for such claims. Several years ago, I looked at Maryland's 120 largest corporations, and I found that three fourths of them had facilities in five or more combined reporting states, and over a quarter maintained their headquarters in combined reporting states. I do want to urge the committee to remove the provision of this bill that provides a new tax deduction to offset a purely on paper effect of the adoption of combined reporting on some corporations. This provision is not in the Senate bill, and it's an unwarranted giveaway that will eventually cost the state a significant share of the revenue for education the bill is intended to raise. I explain why in my written testimony and we'll be happy to answer questions about it. Magnum of combined reporting can make an important contribution to preserving Maryland's tax base from further erosion. And I urge the committee to favorably report the bill with the deferred tax deduction provision removed. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, Donna Edwards, I don't see her in here, but I will call just in case. We'll circle back to her. Shamoya Gardner, please. Good afternoon, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. My name is Shamoya Gardiner. I am the Executive Director of Strong Schools Maryland, and we are here in support of House Bill 457. Our primary stance on economic matters is that public funds ought to be used in the service of the public good, most typically education. However, as there are many loopholes in Maryland's corporate tax law structure, the reality has been that public funds have increasingly been leveraged for private benefit, if those funds are even captured by our tax systems accurately. As a member of the Maryland Fair Funding Coalition's Executive Committee, Strong Schools Maryland has supported previous attempts to modernize and clean up the state's tax code for the benefit of the public. We are urging you not to allow this legislative session to end without fighting to capture the revenue unnecessarily lost to Marylanders each reporting period. The fiscal note for House Bill 457 projects that by fiscal year 2027, these changes would generate more than $180 million in revenue. If you refer to our written testimony, you'll note that fiscal year 27 also happens to be the exact year that the future of the Blueprint Fund is cast into doubt. A favorable vote on House Bill 457 positions Maryland better to answer the question, how will we maintain our commitment to the blueprint for Maryland's future and the world-class schools our students deserve? 
I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the large wealthy entities that would be impacted by the cleaning up of the tax code currently benefit from state tax breaks disproportionately to the benefits seen by individual Marylanders. What's more is that these same corporations will benefit on top of that from the technically skilled graduates that the state will educate if the blueprint is implemented with fidelity. Graduates with experience in apprenticeship programs and those with certifications in career fields that they have demonstrable interest in. That means that no matter which way you vote, large wealthy corporations will still win. The difference is that your support on House Bill 457 would allow for our students and school communities to see some tangible benefit as well. That is at the very least fairness. And for these reasons, we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Next, Andrew Griffin, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Andrew Griffin here on behalf of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce uh, in opposition to House Bill 457. Uh, you have our written testimony, uh, and so I will be brief and just highlight a, a few items for you all. It's been mentioned this is a, this is a policy that has been debated uh, extensively here in Annapolis, introduced for many, many years. Um, the last Business uh, Tax Reform Commission, uh, which issued its report in December 2010, really the last time the state did a comprehensive review of the state's business tax structure, uh, recommended against adopting combined reporting for Maryland's business climate. The primary reason they recommended against that was that they, they felt that the General Assembly had already um, passed certain policy measures such as the Delaware uh, holding company add back provisions, as well as the captive real estate investment trust legislation and other discretionary powers that have been given to the comptroller uh, to adjust income and expenses between corporations and disallow certain deductions and expenses between related corporations. Uh, the idea is th those types of powers prevent the, uh, the tax planning and, and shifting of profits that combined reporting uh, is alleged to fix. And in fact, uh, when the comptroller did its own study um, uh, looking at corporate, corporate um, tax returns over a few years, it actually came out and recommended and, and said that um, it leads to more volatility in, in corporate income tax, which is already a fairly volatile revenue stream uh, for the state. Uh, I will just mention um, in Virginia this past summer, they uh, did undertake a, a study to look at combined reporting and adopting it there. Um, not necessarily apples to apples, but one of the primary reasons that they did not adopt, recommended against adopting combined reporting, uh, was because they, they have these policies, many of which the same Maryland already has. And so I will make one, say one final note uh, about throwback rule. Um, we know that, that as a tax policy, this disproportionately impacts manufacture, the manufacturing sector. Um, uh, since they, they primarily are, are selling and exporting goods across state lines, it seems an odd time to consider a policy like this when um, it's certainly an industry that, that is really struggling to operate at full capacity. Um, right now. With that, I, I will conclude. I will urge an unfavorable report, and I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you. I'm going to circle back to Donna Edwards, who I see is in now. Muted. Thank you. I will get this right. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And I apologize, uh, I was not getting connected. So you have our written testimony, and of course we have been supporting this legislation, House Bill 457. Corporations and large businesses have held Maryland hostage now for nearly two decades, fighting against paying their fair share of taxes and eroding Maryland's corporate tax base. Throwback rule legislation was introduced in 2003 and combined reporting legislation was introduced in 2005. So Maryland has debated this issue too long while more states, now 28 states and DC, have passed this leg legislation. They are collecting the millions of dollars in perennial revenue from combined reporting. And as I just was hearing somebody talk about the Comptroller's Office and the last estimate from the Comptroller's Office they estimated that 94 corporations would pay more taxes if this was passed. And most, if not all of these corporations, they operate in states with combined reporting. 
uh, we hear from Amazon and Target and Comcast that are all against this legislation. But if we just look at Comcast, they have more stores and service centers in combined reporting states like Colorado, Illinois, Michigan, Massachusetts, Texas, than they even have here in Maryland. So it is time that we close this loophole, that Maryland reaps these taxes, and that we not stay in the bottom one of the 16 states that have failed to move this legislation, but that we join the 28 states that have moved forward and have this income coming in on a regular basis. So please give a favorable report to House Bill 457. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're gonna jump back and continue with the unfavorables and Bernard Marx, hopefully I said that correctly. Marzik, Bernie Marzik, Madam yeah. Chair. Yeah. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Bernie Marzik from Cornerstone Government Affairs here today on behalf of the Manufacturers Alliance of Maryland, uh, respectfully uh, requesting an unfavorable report on House Bill 457. Uh, before talking about my opposition, just wanted to take a second to congratulate Gene Berner on his soon-to-be retirement from uh, the Maryland world. As many of you know, for decades, Gene has been here in one capacity or another as a legislative staffer, committee staffer, and uh, lobbying on behalf of the manufacturer. So we wish him well on his soon-to-be retirement. Um, and like Gene has done many times before, I'm here respectfully to oppose the uh, bill before you today, specifically on the throwback rule. Um, this bill would create a new tax here on manufacturers who are creating products in Maryland and then selling them out of state. Um, we feel that this would be detrimental to the manufacturing industry in the state, um, simply because they are located here and selling a product out of state. And whether it's a manufacturer making coffee or clothing or shoes or hardware or electronics, uh, if they make that product here and then sell it somewhere else, they would be uh, charged as tax, which is estimated to be between 50 and $60 million directly on manufacturers here. So on behalf of the Manufacturers Alliance of Maryland, we would ask for an unfavorable report on House Bill 457. Thank you. Thank you. And last to testify is, uh, oh no, not last, sorry, two more. Sarah Price, please, for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. My name is Sarah Price, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association in opposition to this proposal. Um, as the sponsor noted, we have been sharing with you for years that combined reporting and the throwback rule are not consistent or reliable methods for determining a multi-state business's income tax base. Um, I would echo the chamber's comments on this legislation and add that based on most recent data that I could find, the throwback rule has not been implemented in any of our neighboring states. Um, in fact, multiple states across the country have repealed their own throwback rules with the intention of encouraging a more business-friendly environment. And a study commissioned by the New Jersey General Assembly found that the throwback rule does not more fairly measure a corporation's business activities in a state. Business operating costs are continuing to rise alongside the price of everyday goods due to inflation and a variety of other factors caused by the pandemic. We should not be considering imposing an unreliable new tax structure on businesses in Maryland, um, and which could also discourage, it, discourage other businesses from coming here. Um, as of December 2021, the Tax Foundation ranked Maryland as number 46 in the nation for having a business-friendly tax climate, and we would urge you to keep this in mind as you consider this proposal. Uh, we would respectfully urge an unfavorable report. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, Patrick Reynolds, please, for two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Pat Reynolds, and I'm with the Senior Tax Council with the Council on State Taxation. Um, and we are a nonprofit trade industry group, and we represent over 500 of the largest multi jurisdictional businesses in the U.S. And our mission is to preserve and to promote the equitable and non discriminatory taxation of those businesses. 
Uh, so note that we are not one of the organizations that says we want no tax. We are an organization that wants fair and equitable taxation. And you have my written comments, which outline all of the, the reasons why mandatory unitary combined reporting and the throwback rule are a bad idea. Uh, but uh, you don't have to listen to me. In addition to the report uh, that Andrew Griffin mentioned, um, in 2016, uh, the, if you refer to the report of the Maryland Economic Development and Business Climate Commission, that report indicated that this would create revenue volatility, pick winners and losers amongst taxpayers, and I did not see anywhere in that report where they made a distinction between big business and small business, out-of-state business versus in-state business in that, in that uh, analysis. It just said they would create winners and losers. And that includes members of my organization. Uh, there would be winners and there would be losers. Um, and then it would also lead to additional litigation and administrative costs. The recommendation of that, uh, of that group was to not only not adopt combined reporting, but to make clear your intent not to do so going forward. Uh, and with respect to the throwback rule, that is a, you know, no state should determine income by reference to what another state does. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see our first question is from Delegate Ebersol. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I think this is to the sponsor, but uh, someone else might like to pick it up. You quoted that uh, in 2020, by, you said in 2027 that, the, that this would result in $225 million in additional revenue. <clears throat> Originally, I took that to mean cumulatively, but in fact, looking at the, um, at the fiscal note, I think you'd like to say that that's just for that year and maybe talk about that a second or two, the amount of money that would actually come into the state. Um. Thank you, uh, Delegate Ebersol. Thank you for, for raising that question. I've got the fiscal um, uh, impact analysis in front of me, and um, it uh, talks about beginning in FY23, and that would be the first fiscal year from which the throwback rule would, would be in effect. Um, it, it would, uh, the um, revenues would begin um, with 13.2 million increasing to 100. Uh, in 81.4 uh, million for the general fund. And then there's an additional breakout for those other funds I mentioned, the highway user uh, fund and the transportation trust fund. And the total is 228.4 million. Um, to, I'm sorry, does that answer your question? Yes, it tells us that each year we will build to a point where in one year we'll get $225 million. That, in yeah, that's exactly right. And I'm sorry if that was confusing. No, but um, I wanted to give you, I wanted to give it full credit for what it would bring. That's all. Yeah. And, and, and thank you for raising that. Cause in my written statement, we were, we were going by last year's uh, fiscal impact um, uh, statement because we had not yet received this year's and it, it's gone up by something like 20 or 25 million over that phase in period from the estimate last year. Um, the other thing, Madam Chair, um, if I could point out was that um, our, our friend, um, Mr. Mazaroff, who is a, a, a true expert, a, an academic, academician from the um, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, uh, let my office know that he first testified on combined reporting before the Maryland General Assembly in 1986. Wow. So that is, in fact, how long we have been discussing this, uh, this law. Long, long time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate Feldmark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to try to clarify a couple of things we heard. I think it was Ms. Price, who um, referred to Maryland's ranking um, from our business tax climate, can can you um, repeat what what exactly you said about our our ranking in terms of yes, so taxes. The, um, the Tax Foundation is a it's the nation's leading independent tax policy nonprofit. They've been operating since 1937. And um, in a report that was issued in December of 2021, uh, Maryland was ranked as 46th in the nation for 
the uh, business tax climate. I can send you a link to that article, mm-hmm. which includes more statistics explaining why that is the case. I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, because we also heard testimony that 28 states have combined reporting, which means quite a few of them, according to that um, tax foundation study, would have a, a better business tax climate than Maryland with combined reporting. So I'm wondering if you can. Um, so that. this this would have taken a, a look at the greater overall packet, you know, the tax structure in the state. It's not um, exclusively looking at combined reporting or the throwback rule. Um, but our concern is that knowing that Maryland already has a bad reputation in this um, arena, just because other states may have included this doesn't mean that all, you know, that that the other policies that they've implemented haven't sort of balanced that out. Uh, So that's something that Maryland would need to keep in mind. You know, what does the rest of our corporate tax structure look like? um, And how would that be impacted by including these additional policies? Okay, so there may be other changes that could be made to promote better tax fairness and combined reporting as a part of that might actually improve the business tax climate, it sounds like. I am not a tax expert, so I I cannot go so far as to say that I could recommend combined reporting. Um, you know, we, we, we do have concerns about the impact that this would have on businesses that are operating in Maryland. Um, so I, I, I cannot give a rubber stamp here. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep, thanks. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 457, thank you. Turning now to Delegate Charles, House Bill 473. Whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the Ways and Means Committee. I am Delegate Nick Charles, and I am asking for a favorable report for House Bill 473, Income Tax Subtraction Modification for Military Retirement Income. Uh, this bill has passed this, uh, this committee unanimously last year. It's also passed the House floor unanimously last year as well. Uh, just for uh, some updates for those who don't remember the bill, this bill serves as a catalyst to help our most vulnerable veterans, those who gave so much of their life to this country and this state and are now 100% disabled with the rating from the United States Department of Veteran Affairs. This bill will create a tax savings for a retired military veteran who is 100%, has a 100% disability rating from the VA. Under current law, the first $15,000 of military retirement income for a veteran who is at least 55 years old, that can be written off of their taxes. If this passes, when a veteran meets the profile of being retired, 100% service disabled from VA, they will be able to write off 30,000. And so it's not a lot of people that this will impact. This only 700 veterans uh, across the entire state. And this information is coming from Department of Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, that we only have 700 veterans that this is impacting. Uh, They will have to be, once again, 100% service disabled from VA and retired in order to get this additional 15,000 off of their retirement income from their military retirement. I'm asking that you guys give me a favorable report on this particular bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Charles? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 473. Thank you, Delegate. Next, House Bill 315, Delegate Novotny. Whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Atterbury and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Delegate Reed Novotny, representing Howard, Howard and Carroll Counties. We are probably familiar with an article that came out over the summer that ranked Maryland as the 50th of 50 state to re, states to retire. One of the reasons is our tax income, and one of the reasons part of that is our military tax retirement. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the military adds to Maryland and go through a couple of the specialties here. Joint Base Andrews has many missions, but they include a lot of flying missions, uh, which create some great pilots. Aberdeen Proving Ground has the largest test capability in the military and the, and the Army. Fort Detrick does research and development on pathogens, 
very applicable to today's world. Fort Meade is the world's headquarters for intelligence and cybersecurity. Our United States Naval Academy is a world-class university. The Naval Medical Center in Bethesda is the premier flagship medical center for operated by the Navy. Patuxent River Navy Base provides the highest standards in warfare technology through supremacy in naval aviation technology. The Indian Head Navy Base provides research on chemical, biological, radiological defense protection. Camp David supports our president and also international diplomacy. Carter Rock Division of the Naval Surface Warfare Center has 2,000 scientists, engineers, and support personnel. And basically what I've gone through is throughout the entire state, we have multiple locations with active duty members, not to include the bases that are in DC and Virginia. Being in the guard, we actually recruit people off active duty because they're fully trained and they can continue to pursue their careers in the guard. I want Maryland to be the number one state to attract and retain the talent that I just went over so they can retire and continue to serve here in Maryland in their civilian capacities. Even my brother, Colonel Novotny, Ryan Novotny, is about to retire from the Pentagon. And just this week, we had this discussion about how taxing his retirement will, uh, will decide whether he stays or leaves this area and where he gets employment. I want Maryland to join the 35 other states in moving toward not taxing the retirement through this bill. And I think it's a great first step. And of course, if we pass Governor Hogan's uh, complete elimination of retirement tax, I think this would be duplicative. I wanna thank you for your time and ask for a favorable report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Novotny? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 315. I'm now calling House Delegate Novotny's House Bill 317, whenever you're ready. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Chairman Atterbury and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Delegate Reed Novotny, representing Howard and Carroll Counties. The basis of this bill is actually a little bit different than the previous one that I talked about, and this is a phased approach to create the retirement exemption from 15,000 to 100% of the retirement uh, tax that we put on our military retirees. I think it's important for Maryland to be competitive in all of the skill sets to keep those skills here, not only to continue to serve in the defense industrial base, but to fulfill all of the open positions we have throughout our state. I think bringing us into the 36th state uh, that fully exempts their military retirement taxation is a great thing to continue to keep members here after they retire from the military. I would ask the committee a favorable report and I appreciate your time, Madam. <clears throat> Are there any questions for Delegate Novotny? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 317. Thank you. Uh, Madam Colin Chair, we have, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have a witness, Robert Norton. Oh, there? yes, we do. Thank you. So I will recall House Bill 317 and Robert Norton for two minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Am I on? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I'm here to testify in favor of Delegate Novotny's HB 317, Income Tax Subtraction Modification Military Retirement Income. My name is Bob Norton of District 19. I am the president of the 19 military and veterans groups that comprise the Maryland Military Coalition. I'm also a retired army officer and the current president of the Military Officers Association of America, Maryland Council of Chapters. The Maryland Military Coalition strongly supports HB 317. In relation to its relatively small population, Maryland has one of the highest, if not the highest concentration of military bases in the nation as Delegate Novotny noted and they contribute over 15% of our state's GDP, according to Towson University's uh, economic study. HB 317 would phase out over four years state tax on uniform services retired pay. This issue in our view should be seen through the lens of its enormous potential to benefit our state's economy 
by attracting and retaining highly qualified and experienced women and men who have successfully completed challenging and often dangerous careers in service to our nation. They have the right stuff to help lead our economy forward. And these days they have many choices on where to live and work when it's time to take off their uniforms, including 35 states which do not tax military retired pay. Those states include our neighbors, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, um, and um, not Delaware. There's a third state, and I'm sorry, I can't recall it at the moment. Um, I would like to recommend a favorable report on HB 317, Income Tax Subtraction Modification, Military Retirement Income. And we thank Delegate Novotny for his leadership on behalf of our military connected community in our state. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I see Delegate Rose has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Delegate Novotny, for bringing this bill and, and several other bills similar to this that we've heard. Um, for either uh, Mr. Norton, and thank you for your service, or um, Delegate Novotny, thank you for your service. Um, <clears throat> so I think a lot of us living here in Maryland are familiar with sort of that term, the DMV. We're in the DMV. We've got DC, Maryland, Northern Virginia. And you mentioned, one of you mentioned about the competitiveness of, of hiring and jobs. And so we are competing with uh, DC and Virginia, not only those two areas, but um, is it not correct that most of the individuals retiring from the service are retiring with some level of a security clearance, be it a secret, top secret. Is that correct? Either one of you can answer. Yes, that is correct. And those security clearances are in huge demand, not only here in Maryland, but throughout the nation. And states like Virginia certainly are in that category. And in addition to that, and you know, I know that there's, there's a lot of bases and there's a lot of competition for jobs. Um, and some of the states, and, and I don't know if either of you have this information, but uh, Texas, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, you mentioned, uh, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and by just by uh, ge geography, Tennessee, all of these states are actively recruiting um, folks to work on highly paid jobs in those areas. Would, would that be a fair statement? Yes, that's absolutely correct. I'd also add, uh, if I may, Delegate, that sure. um, just recently retired uh, Treasurer Nancy Kopp has noted that there is a growing and concerning loss of people in state employment, uh, highly qualified positions. And we believe that people leaving the military are ideally suited because they have worked in complex, large organizations. And we should do everything we can to recruit them, not only to the defense and cyber industries in our state, but also into state government and to state agencies. Thank you. Um, just one final question, Madam Chair, if you, yeah. if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, so typically um, what happens with these highly qualified individuals, they choose where to retire, they do get their retirement income, but they also typically then move into other industries, as you mentioned, taking a lot of these, these jobs. And they're usually in the high, highly paid category so would it not be fair to say that not only would we retain them um, and maybe mitigate some of the financial impact of exempting some of their retirement income, but these highly paid individuals would then be paying state income tax and other taxes that would you know, turn around and contribute to our Maryland economy? Would that be a fair statement? Well, Delegate Rose, I'll, I'll jump in real, real quick on that. Great question, and you're 100% correct. And we have to remember, too, that two aspects of this. One is most people retire at about 20 years. So you're looking at a member who might be about 40 years old. So right. this individual will retire, hopefully stay in Maryland, and then work for another 20 or 25 years in another profession. So you're going to have a, a great deal of, you know, lifetime of that individual working in a highly paid field, paying all of the other taxes. So, and also this bill is about 
retirement after the age of 55 too. So we would have to wait for they got until they got to 55, then you would have that retirement income deducted. So DLS did a report and it'll say how much it will cost us. But I think if you looked at the larger economic impact, it'll be a great benefit. I personally know many people who live across the line in Pennsylvania per se, and then come down and work at Aberdeen Proving Ground or mm -hmm. Warfield Air Base uh, that are in Baltimore area. So great question though. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you. And and not to not to put two of the aside, typically they're also bringing their families and military spouses who are usually pretty highly trained as well. So thank you very much. And again, thank you for the bill. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 317. Now calling Delegate Jones, House Bill 502. And you have one witness, so whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and fellow members of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I am Delegate Dana Jones. I come before you today with a bill that would create parity during our back to school tax-free week. Each year, Maryland's back to school tax-free week helps provide families with financial relief when purchasing fundamental clothing items such as shoes, jackets, and pants. This tax-free status does not, however, extend to items used to make um, actual clothing, um, tote bags, and so much more. HB 502 would expand the annual sales and use tax free period to sewing items used to make clothing and other items such as fabric, thread, zippers, uh, base tapes, and elastic. The bill would not include items such as sewing machines, pins, pin cushions, scissors, or needles, and would match the $100 limit that is currently applied to pre-made clothing items from homemade reusable tote bags, which help save our environment, to the early days of the pandemic when we were sewing children's masks as we were desperate to help schools get back in person. Um, sewing is an essential need for families and should be treated as such by our laws. Simply put, this bill would create parity in the items we choose to include in our back to school tax-free week. Whether a family chooses to purchase pre-made items or make their own, they should be able to enjoy the same tax benefits. I respectfully urge a favorable report on this simple bipartisan bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm going to call Danielle Schwartzman. She was not seen in the waiting room, but I will call her just in case. Okay, so does anyone have any questions for Delegate Jones? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 502. Thank you, Delegate Jones. Uh, calling House Bill 584, Delegate Hornberger, and there are three folks that are gonna testify whenever you're ready, Delegate. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, members of the committee. The uh, record here, we have HB 584. It's hard to hear you. I don't know what happened. We could hear you at first. No, it's a little low. Um, there you go. That? Is that better? Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, again, for the record, uh, Delegate Kevin Hornberger here on HB 584. Uh, for those members of the committee that have been with us for a few years, you may have recognized this bill from the previous two years. Uh, we were actually able to pass this out of the House uh, two years ago. Last year, we were not able to get it to a vote. Uh, this bill is complex in nature, but it is straightforward in its results. What this bill does is it allows our casinos to incentivize large players. Uh, and by large players, I mean large spenders, uh, referred to in the industry as whales, for example. Uh, this bill allows if, if a certain threshold is reached uh, by a better, uh, and it sets that at around $750,000 that the casino can forgive additional debt. So let's say that a player comes in and has a line of credit, uh, which is typical with, uh, with these larger players, uh, especially international. Um, they, they, can, they can bet on a line of credit of let's say a million dollars. Once they reach a certain milestone and amount betted, the casino would have the ability to forgive some of that total debt. Um, if you read some of the uh, testimony that was submitted by gaming, there seems to be some confusion on that. And I did speak with them. This just does not 
give carte blanche to the casinos to be able to forgive debt. You cannot incentivize players and, and give this credit to them unless they reach that betting milestone. And you might say, well, are you know, are those players doing that already? Why, why do we need to incentivize them? Folks at that level are betting. They're not doing it here. They're doing that, that level of betting in Las Vegas, Nevada, where this is the only other state in the union where that's permissible. So these are a group of people that may travel here for business reasons, may be staying because of access to DC and New York, uh, but they don't have the ability to bet like that on the East Coast. So they either won't bet or they'll go to uh, Nevada to do so. So um, it's, I know it's a little bit complicated. I'm really looking forward to the questions. I also have a panel here um, and, and one of my colleagues uh, to, to help pitch the bill. But um, this is going to greatly increase uh, the amount of funds that come into the Educational Trust Fund and uh, put us on a very competitive stage with the rest of the country and the rest of the world to be able to attract those large cap players. So with that, I ask for a favorable um, bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Kerry Watson. Good to see you, sir. Great to see you. Uh, good, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kerry Watson. Regional Vice President of Government Affairs for MGM Resorts International here in support of House Bill 584. I want to thank Delegate Hornberger for his continued pursuit of this legislation. And I would also like to thank Delegate Kaiser for her joining us in sponsoring this piece of legislation. You know, while the bill is, collect, is titled as uncollectible debt, you know, I kind of believe it would be better stated if, the, if it were something that said something like forbearance of debt. And I'll get into details on that in a moment. But this committee has heard me testify several times, and especially during the lost carryover debate several years ago. My message has been really consistent about there's, there's no business model for a casino in Maryland that is also not directly beneficial to the state of Maryland. You know, and I'm happy to say on lost carryover with Delegate Ebersol defending the bill, we were exactly right on that one. Um, MGM Resorts is a publicly traded company. We all know that, and our shareholders demand prudent and fiduciarily responsible business practices. So giving casino operators the ability to forbear debt, which according to Cornell Law School, and I'll quote it, the act of delaying from enforcing a right, obligation, or debt, for example, a creditor may forbear legal action against a debtor if they settle the debt payment with a new payment with new payment conditions. So that would allow us to use debt to adopt to create additional profitable play at properties. So when calculating the benefit of encouraging a high level player to come to the casino, companies like ours have to take into consideration a number of factors, including the tax station at that, in that jurisdiction. And everyone on this committee knows that Maryland is one of the highest tax states in the, in the country, 56% on slots, 20% on tables. We have to consider travel to the, to the location, space in our hotel we have, at MGM, a very small hotel at 308 rooms. So all of these things are taken into consideration when deciding how to incentivize a, a player from out of state to come into Maryland. So our ability to forbear debt would incentivize a high level player to come back to Maryland and visit casinos in Maryland using our amenities in the state. And Delegate Hornberger gave a great example of, you know, a high level player, if they owe, if they owe us two million and we want to forbear like a hundred thousand dollars to use it as a package to continue to get them back into our property to spend far more than that, you know, that's beneficial to the casino and to the state. And the fiscal note, you know, rightfully, understandably so, I should say, is concerned about the impact to the to the um, Maryland's blueprint, the blueprint for Maryland's future. Well, you know, again. Like I said in the very beginning, if we're trying to generate more business and grow more revenue, that is directly beneficial to the state. And so for those reasons, you know, I hope that we can get a favorable report from this committee and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Kevin, I'm gonna say T. And is he in here? Let's see. I don't think I see him, uh, Haley. Uh, Delegate Hornberger, uh, we don't see him. This is your colleague, Kevin. Uh, I actually was uh, referring to um, uh, Delegate Kaiser. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I don't see him. So are there any questions? I see Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. Uh, this is a complicated issue, but I think it's important for the committee just to get a sense that um, there was a time when the when the casinos paid 
each day based on their winnings. They declared how much they won and they paid tax on it on a daily basis. And the thing they call loss carry forward, what you're hearing about, involves if they lost a lot of money one day, they, they in a way to encourage people to bet a lot of money, they could roll that. Th- that day they would pay zero taxes, but then if they won a lot the next day, they pay a lot of taxes. We allow them to count forward and say, well, if they lost a lot, they could take it off of their winnings the next day and then not have to pay tax on that. So they were able to subtract, they carried the loss forward. So my question is, I don't know, I don't know if that's a good enough lesson or not, but I'm not going to stretch it out here. Delegate Horn- Hornberger and perhaps Mr. Watson as well. Um, my question is, is this part of the loss carry forward? If you forgive this loan, does this come off of the taxable winnings that you guys do? And for how long on a day when you when you win a lot? Yeah, so there's there's really two questions there. Yes. Um, in addressing the first question, this won't have an impact on loss carryover tabulation. What this will have an impact on is if once that once that amount of debt is forgiven, and then this is why we need the legislation to do so, the um, that that uh, precludes the casino from having to remit the tax on the forgivens to the educational trust fund. So, in other words, um, it's it's a hold harmless to the casino, and that's why that's why they're going to be inclined to do it because you wouldn't want to forgive debt to a large customer and then have to be able to turn around and pay the you know, pay, pay the, the fine or the fee or the tax rather to the state. So is it too much of an oversimplification to say that this would come off of their taxable winnings somewhere if they forgave this? Well, it's uh, because it's because it's extended to the customer as a line of credit, no money has actually changed hands. So in other words, the, the casino player is not coming to the table with 2 million, playing 2 million, and then getting some money back. This is these these are um, highly f- sophisticated tools that they use to attract these large players. Right. Where they have equity, just like you know, issuing credit um, from a credit card company. You know, you have to have two things: equity and payment history. We try. So, we try. I think we're getting too far. But one more time, just they're they're going to be realizing a loss somehow if they forgive a loan to someone, forgive money that they are owed ultimately. And I want to know if that money will be applied to the taxable winnings uh, that the handles, as it were, that that they supply in any or if it could be in any way. Yeah, well, because they're not because this practice isn't happening outside of Las Vegas, the scenario that you just posed isn't occurring. So what these casinos do, especially MGM, who is a global company, is they send those players there's, there's highly sophisticated, very large players to Las Vegas. If, right. I, if I can, but, if it I could ha- but it could happen here. It could happen. Well, so, I mean, your question's well asked. And if I could try to, without getting too deep into the weeds on this, right. We have to what's happening to is, you know, we, we exist in eight different jurisdictions throughout the country and certainly over in China as an example. And for these largest players, we literally, encourage them to come to our different locations throughout the country. And at the same time, we're competing against other casinos, let's say a casino in Florida, like Hard Rock. I shouldn't name anybody, but we're competing against for those very same players. So a company like ours puts together a package to incent a player to come to Maryland. There's a lot of things that we have to take in consideration. If they have lost a significant amount of money and we're able to forgive a certain portion of that, part of that calculation, a very complex calculation, of course, is how much taxes that we pay on that loss. Right. So we anticipate, you know, you've said it before in public, so I'm not you know, telling anyone any, anything that, people, that we're in the business of making money and we calculate these things to ensure that we are making money. And whenever we make revenue, the state directly benefits from that revenue increase. So we're not going to make a plan that isn't beneficial to the state. And this is not used a lot. It's used for really that top, top tier player that we have to encourage because they can go anywhere in the world and we have to give them a reason to come to Maryland. Delegate Eversall? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you. Delegate Feldmark? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I guess my question is a follow-up. 
Um, I know Delegate Ebersol was seeking clarity. I'm not sure that's where that exchange led me. Um, but so, so if someone, um, someone gets this line of credit to play, yep. they lose the casino forgives a portion of the debt they've incurred. We're still talking imaginary money, right? Like no, yeah. no money has actually changed hands at this point. Correct. Is that, so, so what's getting taxed? So two things. Once, one is that they have to reach the trigger mechanism. Right. So if if I give you a line of two million dollars of credit and you come and play one hundred thousand dollars, this doesn't apply to you. You have to play and obligate yourself to that threshold level, which I believe that we have it set at seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So once you once you reach that, you can you have the potential the, the casino has the potential to now opt you into this cohort. Right. So you continue to play you play to the $2 million mark or the $1 million mark. The casino can, can then say, you had a bad day, you had a bad week, you know, whatever. And um, instead of me extracting that $2 million from your bank account, I'm gonna extract 1.75 million. Does that, does that make sense? And then from the, for the answer to your question on the tax standpoint, right. If it was status quo, if nothing changed, the casino would have to issue $2 million worth of transaction tax to the state. If we pass so, the bill, mm -hmm. then, the, then the casino can say, I forgave because they reached that threshold and I'm only going to remit 1.75 million of tax to the state. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. And, and if Thank I can you. add, if, if it's okay, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Yes. For, for the delegate, for the delegate, and we're not forgiving two hundred fifty thousand in that scenario just provided out of the kindness of our heart. That fifty thousand is connected to an understanding that that credit line will be extended to another number that they can gamble on to encourage them to come back and play at our casinos, theoretically, in order to encourage more play and what more play in most cases, the majority of cases means is more revenue. Delegate Eversall. Yeah, one more just for committee clarity. So this is the same idea in spirit that we did when we did the loss carry forward where we may actually not realize some of the money that we would have in taxes on the casino, but you're asking us to, to trust you and we do because here you are in our state but that this will ultimately result in greater winnings for you and greater taxes for us. So we have to cross our fingers and hope you guys know what you're doing here. And uh, clearly, clearly you do, but is that a fair kind of quick characterization of it here? No, yes, that's, great, that's a great question. Um, we, we, we understand your trepidation about a concept like this. And this is a novel approach, right? It's only being utilized in one state and it is successful. To strengthen the bill, uh, we have added, this is a change from previous years, we have added reporting language, we have added a sunset, and we have forced the casino to every time that they utilize this tool to notify us of such okay. so that we can actually benchmark and say, you know, this is in fact doing what we set out for it to do and um, in bringing more money into the educational trust yeah. fund. And, but and that's good. And the concerns. And you say after trepidation, I, actually, we t we've taken this chance with the loss carry forward. And although it's hard to quantify it exactly, and I hope the reporting does some of that, mm -hmm. because we don't really know how people react, if they really come back or not, or if they're really, really willing. But uh, the uh, casinos claim it's helping them. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I just want to make sure that, I mean, this is another version of loss carry forward in a sense. I know it's not the same thing, but where we're allowing for something. So, um, Really, it's just commentary, and I'm sorry, Madam Chair, it wasn't a question. Okay, thank sure. you. And um, Madam Chair, I think the other person, Carrie, may have logged in, if you take another look there. Kaveen, 
Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. Yeah. T. He's on the call. It's, yeah. it's hard to scroll through here. <laughs> Apologize. But um, but yeah, so and if he's not, then that's okay. I think there's written testimony as well. But uh, really enjoyed the conversation here and glad to answer any other additional questions. Um, but but I'm asking for a favorable report. So thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 584. House Bill 366, Delegate Learman, hello. hello. Uh, whenever you're ready, you can begin. Great. Hello, friends on Ways and Means. Great to be here today. I am bringing HB 366, um, legislation to create a legal division within the office of the comptroller um, with the purpose of providing tax advice. Uh, private letter rulings for Maryland taxpayers, including both individuals and businesses. So this legislation, although it is a relatively small change at face value, uh, will really help with a number of areas in tax law in Maryland. Um, it will help with one, closing the tax gap, right? what people and businesses pay versus what they owe. Uh, two, it'll help ease compliance with tax laws for Maryland taxpayers. And three, um, it will ultimately decrease waste of state and taxpayer resources. Uh, but first, what is a private letter ruling? Um, a private letter ruling is a written determination issued by the comptroller applying tax laws and regulations to a specific set of facts. So this committee, in all of its wisdom, passes tax laws um, every year, and we want to make sure um, that people know what they mean. Um, some are big, some are small, some, you know, uh, families and businesses, they have to determine how those changes that we pass will affect them and their specific circumstances. Um, some people and businesses hire accountants or tax attorneys to determine what they owe. Um, but, you know, for some small businesses and families, that can be really an additional expense that's difficult to absorb. So then what happens? Well, a business or a family may try to interpret the tax amount that they are supposed to owe on their own. Um, they may pay too little. Um, and then the state is being shortchanged. That's where the tax gap comes from. The state may not realize that they've paid too little and we might not get that money or the state will realize it. Um, and then we'll have to go and file, <laughs> we'll have to go to try to collect that money after the fact from the business or family. Um, that takes up additional time and expenses for everyone, the state and the family or business. Um, for the last, uh, the last year we could find data for this was 2015, over 200,000 Marylanders faced penalties totaling over $40 million. So, you know, the stress, the hardship associated with these fees and penalties is often completely avoidable. And the effort and time required by the comptroller's office to actually collect that money can be incredibly burdensome. We want to avoid that as much as possible. And this bill is one way to help us avoid that so that people are paying what they owe. Hold on for a minute. Um, sorry. Um, at least 33 other states have an office uh, devoted to providing private letter rulings and tax guidance, like the one under this bill. And implementing this process was a key recommendation of the Augustine Commission. So with that, I'll just say I ask for a favorable vote on HB 366. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Justin Hayes, but I don't see him in here. I think somebody else is here. Or Madam, Madam Chair, it's, it's actually Deborah Gorman. Okay, thank you. Oh. Deborah Gorman, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chairman Washington, members of the committee. I am Deborah Gorman, Deputy Director of the Revenue Administration Division, and I am here on behalf of the Comptroller's Office. It is my pleasure to provide this testimony in support of House Bill 366, and I certainly would like to thank Delegate Learman for sponsoring this very important legislation. Uh, you do have our written testimony, and I encourage you to refer to that for additional detail, and I, I echo Delegate Learman's comments, but I would just like to emphasize a few points. Uh, private letter rulings are given prospectively so that a taxpayer, frequently a business, can rely on that comptroller's ruling and have certainty around their ta tax obligations. That's an important factor in their long-term business planning, including decisions about where to locate a business or whether to continue conducting business in a particular state. Our neighboring jurisdictions of Virginia, Pennsylvania, and District of Columbia all offer these private letter, private letter rulings. And tax practitioners routinely ask our office, when will we be able to provide these rulings for their clients? 
And while the legislature has provided us with the authority to issue these rulings, we support this bill, which would finally provide the necessary funding for us to provide this extremely important service to the taxpayers. So I respectfully request that you return a favorable report on the bill so the Comptroller's Office may fulfill the recommendation of the Augustine Commission to provide a stronger, more certain business climate in the state of Maryland and to provide this very personalized level of tax guidance that, our, that Maryland taxpayers require. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Karen Cirillo for two minutes, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, it's a pleasure to see you. My name is Karen Cirillo. I'm a CPA in Maryland for over 40 years now. I'm here representing the Maryland Association of CPAs and my 9,000 fellow CPA members. Um, we CPAs fully support House Bill 366 that establishes a private letter ruling process. And I appreciate everything that Delegate Learman and Ms. Gorman from the Comptroller's Office said. Um, and we are in support of the bill with um, a request for one small amendment that I understand is in process, an amendment that would uh, remove the current wording in the bill that creates a three-year expiration of the controller's ruling letter. There are many tax matters that can remain the same after three years and making the taxpayer reapply for a new letter after only three years when nothing has changed just causes extra time and expense for the taxpayer and extra time for the controller's office to issue a new uh, ruling. After that amendment, removing the three-year expiration, the bill still provides that the ruling um, uh, only stops being binding if the facts have changed or if the law has changed or if there's been a court decision that changes the answer. That um, is how the IRS and how all but one of the several dozen other states that do a private letter ruling process do their procedures. So um, we believe that the three-year um, limitation is not necessary and troublesome, and we appreciate the um, amendment and look forward to um, its passage too. In general, CPAs have been looking forward to this program for a long time. The Augustine Commission in 2016, there was also legislation in 2016 mandating the process, but the funding has never been provided to the controller's office. Right now, the process for asking for uh, answers to technical questions from the controller's office is very informal. Um, the ruling process will bring greater certainty because the, control, the uh, taxpayer can rely on the controller's letter and not have to worry about a, an auditor later disagreeing with the original answer that somebody else gave in this informal process. The private letter ruling process will give uh, certainty. And uh, to a point that um, Delegate Learman made, I am absolutely convinced that this will also help Maryland's revenue because when a taxpayer gets a binding letter on the answer to his questions, um, he or a business are most likely to use that answer in preparing their tax returns. And so the state will get the right amount of tax money in the right year rather than many, many years later after an audit or litigation. So uh, the CPAs respectfully ask for a um, positive vote on the amendment and a favorable report on the bill. Thank you very much for thank your time. You. Uh, thank you. And first question is from Delegate Lukey. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Delegate, thank you for bringing this bill. I think it's long overdue for us to get this process going in the Comptroller's Office. The um, amendment just referred to the removal of the provision to automatically sunset rulings after three years. Um, do, do you have a reaction to that? Is that uh, something? Um, it's, a, it's a friendly amendment. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a friendly amendment and it makes sense to avoid um, additional expense for taxpayers and the Comptroller's Office. So yep, I support it. Great, thank you very much. Yep. Are there any further questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 366. Calling House Bill 403 and uh, committee members, Delegate Corman is busy in a subcommittee uh, meeting. So his aide, Joseph Swift, is here and will present his bill. And then there are um, other folks signed up to testify. So Mr. Swit, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, and thank you for allowing me to be here on behalf of Delegate Corman. He sends along his apologies, obviously he's chairing the Transportation and Environment Subcommittee budget hearing. So I'm here on his behalf to present HB 403, which concerns tax exemptions 
um, to businesses who transition to employee stock ownership plans. And we believe that this will have many benefits for small businesses that currently have no succession plan for when the owner retires. This is a common problem that a lot of small businesses face, especially those in rural areas when the owner reaches or retirement age or gets close to retirement age. If they don't have a succession plan in place for what's going to happen to the company, that can cause a lot of instability and turmoil in terms of you know, what that means for the jobs of the employees who currently work there. And so what the bill does is it provides an incentive um, for any business that wants to transition to that employee stock ownership plan. And there are many listed uh, benefits of, the, of having employee ownership in business that uh, some of our panel members we'll get to in more detail, but to summarize, um, it, the studies have shown that it greatly increases worker retention, worker productivity, worker benefits, pay, um, the list goes on, goes on down the line. And so we believe that this bill will provide a valuable um, safety net for any business that um, has an owner that is reaching that retirement age and wants to do right by their employees and make sure that those jobs are, um, are going to be stable down the line and actually get bring the employees into the ownership structure and allow them to actually benefit from from the profits of the company and um, with that madam chair i will see to the panel thank you uh, charlotte davis please for two minutes good afternoon i'm charlotte davis i'm the executive director of the rural maryland council i also serve on the board of directors for the keystone development center that is our state's cooperative development center located in Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania. Um, we are in support of House Bill 403. Um, we for, uh, oftentimes cooperatives are a solution to a lot of rural challenges. Um, wor worker cooperatives in general, though, are um, especially beneficial. We think um, it provides workers with a higher wage for their labor and um, they're generally more productive and it is a democratic process for governing the business. Um, the RMC, we've been here before talking about our concerns about our declining population in rural areas, as well as our aging population and concerned about keeping wealth and keeping jobs in our rural areas as, as much as possible. Um, transitioning farms and transitioning these business is a real concern. We funded in 2017, a Frostburg University program to examine how strategies that we could employ to transition some of these aging businesses. Um, they found that there were 20 jobs in Western Maryland, alone, or 20 businesses in Western Maryland alone that uh, were interested in transitioning to the next generation, um, but they were only able to identify five in, uh, individuals that were willing to take those on, leaving a huge gap of no solution for those businesses. And we wanna make sure that we keep those jobs um, but also allow our uh, population to retire when they're needed. So um, we think this is an incentive to encourage uh, these businesses to stay in our rural areas and we encourage your favorable report of House Bill 403. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Chris Michael, please, for two minutes. Uh, thanks so much, Madam Chair, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Christopher W. Michael. I'm policy director of the Maryland Center for Employee Ownership. This is a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting employee ownership in the state of Maryland. Uh, just for purposes of identification, I'm also managing director of the Institute for the Study of Employee Ownership and Profit Sharing, which is the leading global academic institute and fellowship program for scholarship on employee share ownership, which is based at Rutgers University. Um, I'm also an assistant professor there at the School of Management and Labor Relations, and I serve on the advisory board of the New Jersey, New York Center for Employee Ownership. Uh, additionally, I'm founder of EOT Advisors, which is the first investment banking and financial advisory firm in the country dedicated to assisting business owners sell to an employee ownership trust. I hold law licenses in New York, New Jersey, Minnesota, and the District of Columbia. And I uh, uh, should add that I have family in Maryland. All of my in-laws are based in uh, Burtonsville, Maryland, and, and my wife was raised in Montgomery County. So uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I've been coming down a few years before COVID. It's always a beautiful time of year right now, as telling Joseph earlier. Uh, it's always really a lot of fun to come down to Annapolis. Wish I could be there with you guys in person. Uh, I'll just, you know, I've already submitted written testimony and submitted it in previous years. I'll just share now, you know, the verdict is in. The federal government has been supporting employee ownership for half a century. 
Um, employee ownership has been a tool for even longer than that in the United States. It's great for business owners. It's great for workers. It's great for managers. It's great for the community. And there's a consensus in the policy community in the United States that the federal government's been doing its share for 50 years. And it's, you know, that dates back to 74 is the, is the year. And it's time now for states to, to kind of make the next move. And, and there's again, a general consensus that, you know, the bills like the one that like 403 make a lot of policy sense uh, to uh, provide a relatively small incentive to business owners and then reap the rewards in future years. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't see him in here, but I am gonna call Christopher Croft who was signed up to testify. Uh, he is not here. So with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, seeing no questions, you guys are supposed to, everybody's supposed to raise their hand and say they have questions for Mr. Swit since he's standing in and give him a hard time. But, I'm a new chair, I'm gonna to have to teach you guys to play along. Okay, thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 403. Thank you very much. Moving on to House Bill 466, Delegate Valentino Smith, and she has about three or four folks here to testify. So whenever you're ready, Delegate, you may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's nice to be here before you and you may be the only one that doesn't have a cloud over their head saying, uh-oh, she's here again for the same thing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to your introduction. Um, you know, as a legislative body, each session, you guys sit and you reevaluate the tax code and you offer amendments and you balance all of the requests to try and ensure that the tax code alleviates tax burden and is fair um, and equitable in application. So I'm here again um, through House Bill 466 to suggest that we offer the physically disabled a $1,000 tax exemption. Currently in section 10-211B, you have a list of tax exemptions. And in B4, we allow working Marylanders who are blind to claim a $1,000 tax exemption. And it's unclear, you know, as much as we look back at the legislative history, why at that point only the blind were afforded the $1,000 exemption. It may have been when we look back that the legislature took into account the extra costs of braille materials. It also was at a time when the government had changed the federal income tax laws and the General Assembly was doing a big omnibus bill that I found in the file allowing a lot of different tax exemptions to try to help balance state tax burden compared to the increased federal burden. So as you know, a couple of years ago, the federal law changed and a lot of Marylanders can't deduct the way they used to. And I know your committee has been evaluating and balancing that. So nevertheless, we allow the blind $1,000 tax exemption. Today, it's the proposal that we expand that to the physically disabled that work and who work. We have indications that about 39% of Marylanders with disabilities actually are employed and that their mean income ends up actually being about 30% less than individuals without disabilities. They make less income and they incur significant expenses related to working. They've got to make major adjustments to their living spaces. They've got to adjust their vehicles. They've got to purchase additional devices to help with their independent living. They have different food costs and food preparation costs and a lot of additional medications and supplies that aren't covered by insurance. Under current tax law, as you all know more than I do, those with a permanent disability are allowed to claim a pension exclusion. So we already have a mechanism in tax law for identifying those people that are physically disabled. The amendment, um, the bill now, I think Delia Barnes was helping me clarify last year, there was an amendment. It's included in the bill now, which shows the specific ability using the same thing that they use in the pensions exemption. The person has to submit documentation from a physician with the nature of the disability, the disability is expected to continue indefinitely, and that the individual is capable of gainful employment. So I'm pleased to say, I don't know how many people say this, my fiscal note this year in talking to the fiscal note writers is almost $2 million less than last year. So last year I was concerned that the fiscal net writers over exemplified the bill by including cognitive and physical disability. This year they brought it down to a $1.7 million fiscal note. So I don't know how many other are promising you lower fiscal notes, but I did it. 
So although we know there are some fiscal costs related to this bill, what we do know is that money goes straight back into the economy. This is one of the tax um, credits that you know is spent right back in the economy by those who get it. So I respectfully, again, hope that in your balancing of the tax credits that you'll provide this year, that we recognize those that are physically disabled in work and offer them the same $1,000 exemption that we offer to those that are blind. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And next, Lori Scott for two minutes, please. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm here to support House Bill 466 to allow income tax exemption for people with disability, physical disabilities. And thank you, Delegate Valentino Smith for uh, bringing this bill forward again uh, to allow people with physical disabilities a thousand dollar tax credit. I have a 19 year old daughter who is wheelchair bound and uses it to go to school and to access the community, to go to job coaching, volunteering, going to church. She'd be unable to effectively access her community or school or work without our um, without our van. And um, she wouldn't be able to be with her peers and things like that without her wheelchair. So in the last three months, we have spent $800 on ramp modifications, $420 on electronics for her electric wheelchair, not covered by insurance, $385 to remodify her braces for her legs. Um, since that was less than two years that she had them done originally, insurance would not pay for them. And she recently had surgery. And today I spent $150 on a new battery for her wheelchair. Um, as you can see, $1,000 goes very, very fast. And for people with disabilities who are working, oftentimes they do not make the same amount of money per hour per year as their neurotypical peers. People with physical disabilities have these additional barriers just because in order to access life, they need these things. So a $1,000 tax credit would certainly be helpful uh, for those types of people. So because of that and the barriers that we face, we're hoping for your support in House Bill 466. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Mary O'Mara, please, for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your time uh, this afternoon. And thank you to Delegate uh, Geraldine Valentino-Smith for her um, continued support of this bill and pushing this through. We're most grateful for all the work that you do. My name is Mary Omara. I'm the Executive Director for the Office of Deaf and Disability Ministries in the Archdiocese of Washington. The Office of Deaf and Disability Ministries in the Archdiocese of Washington serves to empower and support persons who are deaf and those living with disabilities to be full and active participants in all aspects of their parish life. Our parishes are located in five Maryland counties. Subsequently, we support House Bill 466, noting the just provision of an additional $1,000 tax deduction for persons living with a permanent physical disability. This builds on the precedent of the current Maryland tax law, which provides such deductions for persons who are blind. House Bill 466 expands on a successful Maryland tax deduction for those persons who are blind to then apply to persons living with physical disabilities as the next consistent step for an allowable tax deduction. As all Marylanders begin the effort from telework options during COVID-19 back to in-person work environments, those Marylanders living with physical disabilities face additional expenditures in covering the costs required for modifications to vehicles for work commutes, adaptive equipment on site at their offices to enable them to function and work in their role, as well as other assistive mobility aids and devices. Noting that Maryland takes great pride in being an employment first state, House Bill 466 additional $1,000 tax deduction would go a long way in supporting all Marylanders in this effort by offsetting the cost of expenses incurred by persons with physical disabilities that are not covered by insurance. As such, the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Washington Office for Deaf and Disability Ministries supports House Bill 466. Thank you Thank so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. And next, Matthew Rice, please, for two minutes. Um, good afternoon, uh, Delegate Atterbury, members of the committee. My name is Matthew Rice. I am the Director of Public Policy for the Ark of Maryland, one of Maryland's um, largest 
statewide advocacy organizations advocating for the rights of individuals with um, disabilities and their families. Um, I'm also testifying on behalf of the Maryland Association of Community Services, People on the Go of Maryland, and the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council. All of our organizations support HB 466 because as it has already been stated, we feel that allowing people with physical disabilities a, an additional $1,000 tax deduction helps them um, and helps our Maryland economy. I can tell you personally, when uh, transitioning from a work in person environment to a work from home environment that I'm also looking to modify um, for other purposes, an additional $1,000 um, would help me a great deal and I recognize the struggles that other individuals and families have with intellectual and or physical uh, disabilities. Um, the bottom line is we're looking for a hand up, not a handout. And as has already been mentioned, uh, Maryland is an employment first state. So this is in keeping with um, established policy by the um, governor and the administration. Um, this is quite simply the right thing to do. And there is historical precedent because when Congress created um, the Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, and please excuse the terminology that is what is used, um, they recognized the barriers that those with physical disabilities experience. So for those reasons, we ask the committee for a favorable report. Thank you. Are there any questions for the bill sponsor or uh, any of the witnesses? Okay, seeing no questions, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 466. Thank you all. Next, House Bill 492. Delegate Johnson, and there are six folks uh, that will be testifying. So whenever you're ready, Delegate. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members of the Ways and Means Committee. I'm Delegate Johnson here to present House Bill 492, Sales and Use Tax, Oral Hygiene Products Exemption. The purpose of this bill is to provide an exemption from the sales and use tax for the sale of certain oral hygiene products to include toothbrushes, toothpaste, tooth powders, mouthwash, floss, or other similar oral hygiene products. Dental and oral hygiene is an essential part of a person's overall health and well-being. Poor oral hygiene can not only lead to dental cavities and gum disease, but also has been linked to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, premature birth, and low birth weight. Bacteria in the mouth can also be pulled into the lungs causing pneumonia and other respiratory diseases. Maintaining healthy teeth and gums is a lifelong commitment. However, the burden of oral disease is much higher in poor and disadvantaged pop population groups. In the US, oral health disparities are persistent in, po in the population. The National Institute of Health reports that people are more likely to have poor oral health if they are low income, uninsured, and or members of a racial ethnic group. Immigrants or rural populations have suboptimal access to quality oral health care. As a result, poor oral health services serves as the national symbol for social inequality. With many families' paychecks still suffering and inflation rates rising, the financial hardships associated with COVID-19 are still being felt today. I believe this exemption, in a small way, we can help Maryland families with products they use on a daily basis by not only providing monetary relief, but also encouraging better oral, health, oral hygiene. It is easier to avoid cost, costly dental procedures and long-term health issues with early intervention and proper oral hygiene habits. 
Therefore, I respectfully request a favorable report on House Bill 492. And Madam Chairman, I don't know if you've got the letter uh, in time, but I would like to add that I got a letter from the Funk and Bolton uh, Law Group that it says uh, we didn't get chosen to testify today. Uh, you can tell Delegate Johnson that he can say the insured industry, including health and dental insurers, are in full support of House Bill 492. And with that, I'll turn it over to my panel. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, and we'll begin with Neil Karkanis for two minutes, please. Um, Madam Chair and members of the Ways and Mean, Means Committee, thank you for your time today. Delegate Johnson, that was actually from us. So I'm glad it came through. We got our link a, a oh, little thank later. You. Um, but for the record, I am Neil Karkanis on behalf of the Alliance of Maryland Dental Plans and the League of Life and Health Insurers. Um, we applaud Delegate Johnson for bringing this legislation forward. And of course, we support any way to get Marylanders the hygiene products they need to live a healthy life. Of course, oral health is emblematic of other health and prevention efforts not only ensure good health, but they can also save the state significant dollars on emergency room visits. Um, so for those simple reasons, we, we urge a favorable report on House Bill 492. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Katie Batani for two minutes, please. Thank you uh, to the chair, vice chair, delegate Johnson and committee members. My name is Katie Batani and I've been a dental hygienist for 20 years in Maryland and have worked in dental public health for the last 10 years, working to improve access to and use of dental care for Maryland families. I've seen the impact on adults and children who suffer from oral diseases and pain in their mouths and who face challenges accessing the dental health care system. I'm here to strongly support HB 492 that accepts essential dental hygiene project products from the sales and use tax. Maintaining good oral health is essential to overall health and quality of life, as we've heard. Access to dental products that are critical for daily oral care at home, including toothbrushes, fluoride tooth, toothpaste, which is key to preventing tooth decay, dental floss, and other hygiene products will help Marylanders maintain their oral health and prevent serious disease and illnesses. Currently, Maryland exempts other healthcare products such as over-the-counter medications, baby oil, baby powder, and feminine hygiene products from its sales and use tax. Tooth decay, which is largely preventable, con continues to plague both children and adults. 17% of low-income children aged two to five years, 45% of low-income adults aged 20 to 64 years, and 33% of low-income older adults over age 65 had, have untreated tooth decay. Improving access to and use of dental hygiene products can help prevent this. Dental professionals routinely recommend replacing toothbrushes every three months or sooner if an individual has been sick, brushing at least twice a day and flossing once a day, and using a rice size amount of fluoride toothpaste for children under age three and a pea size amount for people over age three when brushing teeth. However, using large amounts of toothpaste and frequently replacing toothbrushes and dental floss has cost implications that can be prohibitive for low-income families and individuals. By eliminating a financial barrier to these essential dental hygiene products, individuals can prevent tooth decay and gum disease. Maryland should take this simple step to make these products more products more affordable. I ask for a favorable report on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Janelle. I don't see her. If you are here, please speak up. Janelle Animalki. So I don't think she is with us. Uh, John McLucky. Yes. Okay. Here, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Atterbury, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of House Bill 492. My name is Robbie McLucky. My, I go by my, my middle name, Robert. And uh, I'm testifying today on behalf of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. It's the National Trade Association representing the manufacturers of over the counter medicines, dietary supplements, and consumer medical devices. House Bill 492 expands access to oral hygiene products for Maryland residents by exempting these critical OTC devices and medicines from sales tax. 
oral hygiene products such as toothbrushes, toothpaste, mouthwash, dental floss, and others are essential purchases for Marylanders and their families. Unfortunately, millions of Americans face barriers to accessible and affordable dental care. These bar barriers make routine preventative care habits such as brushing and flossing more critical than ever. Regular preventative dental care is essential for good oral health. Most oral health conditions are preventable and or treatable through products that are commercially available over the counter. Furthermore, research, recent research has linked good oral care to cardiovascular health and other conditions. Many low-income families struggle to afford oral hygiene products and to exacerbate the problem, the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Supplemental N Nutrition Assistance Program does not cover these products for participants. The sales tax exemption posed in House Bill 492 would be an important step to increasing access and affordability to critical oral hygiene products for, Ma for Marylanders. We applaud Representative Johnson for, Johnson for introducing this bill, and we urge this committee to favorably report House Bill 492. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And next we have John Andrzak for two minutes, please. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman and Medal members of the committee. My name is Jack Andrzak, and I'm before you today on behalf of GSK uh, Consumer Healthcare. GSK uh, Consumer Healthcare is one of the largest manufacturers of oral health care products in the world. Aquafresh, Sensodyne, and Ambisol, and Polydent are among their better known products. <clears throat> GSK is before you today because one of its uh, corporate priorities is to improve the health care for people in the United States and uh, elsewhere. This bill is important because poor, health care, poor oral health care is most evident among those uh, low income adults and those on limited income, such as uh, the elderly. Good oral health care, um, good oral health care practices like brushing your teeth and flossing prevent serious and more costly dental and healthcare problems that can come about in the future. In difficult financial times, oral healthcare products often are viewed as less essential to those who are feeling financial, the financial pinch. This bill provides some help with the, um, the cost of those products. And as we all know, every little bit can help. <clears throat> GSK, uh, is not before you today because it believes it will um, sell more products as a result of this bill. It's before you today because it believes that it, um, it helps oral health care for all Marylanders. Uh, we urge a favorable report on House Bill 492. Thank you. Are there any questions for the bill sponsor or any of the witnesses? Okay, seeing none, thank you all very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 492. Moving on to House Bill 432, Delegate Wells, and she has about 10 folks signed up uh, to testify with us here today who will each have two minutes. Whenever you're ready, Delegate Wells, hello. Hello, thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman Atterbury. It is a pleasure to call you by those words this afternoon. Um, also would like to degree the members of the committee. For the record, I am Delegate Melissa Wells and I'm here to testify on HB 432, the Maryland Film Production Activity Tax Credit. So I will not be before you too long because I know that there are ample uh, testimony that follows me, but I really just wanted to kind of share a little bit personally why this bill is really important to me. Um, and so as some of you may know, I originated in California and this is where my uncle and my father's really paved the way for our family when they left Mississippi, um, especially in the film industry. My uncle Chuck, he is now deceased, but he was the first black key grip in Hollywood. And so I was able to really see um, how successful of a life he had along with my uncle George and many of my cousins of follow where they were able to live great lives and retire and still many of them are um, in the industry as directors of photography. And so, um, but the other, but the, you know, even more important reason why I'm bringing this is because here in Maryland, um, Maryland really is a viable destination for film and it could, it could be even more viable if we uh, were able to provide more resources. I know that this is not the first time this committee is hearing uh, a plea for more resources for um, our state's film production activity tax credit, but especially as a state that we coin ourselves America in miniature, I think there's so much more opportunity for us to utilize um, the beautiful scenery and for us to also capitalize on the amazing film programs um, 
that exist here in the state of Maryland. And also just want to add that uh, there have been shows that we that be, that were initially filmed here that um, we have lost out to like Veep because we couldn't afford to keep them here uh, because we did not um, have the resources for that tax credit. Additionally, there have been other shows that were uh, scouted like in Prince George's for Manhunt. Um, and so I really feel as if, if we were able to put more resources into this program, that not only will we see the economic and uh, revenue generation benefits, but we'll also see the job, the job creation and uh, sustenance as well. And so for these reasons, I am asking for a favorable report, and I will leave you in the hands of uh, the witnesses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delegate Wells. And first, uh, Debbie Dorsey, please, for two minutes. Hi, um, and thank you, Delegate Wells, for introducing this uh, legislation. And uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Debbie Dorsey. I'm the director of the Baltimore Film Office, and I'm here today on behalf of the Maryland Film Industry Coalition. We fully support House Bill 432. Increasing the annual incentive for film production in the state will create more jobs for crew, talent, and opportunities for students and other entry-level jobs as well as economic spend for business, businesses of all sizes throughout the state. The industry is shovel ready through any kind of economy. When the pandemic hit, studios and labor leaders created strict COVID protocols in order to get people back to work and to also address the need for content. In late 2020 through 2021, commercials, independent films, a pilot and a mini series filmed in Maryland, putting our crew and actors back to work and supporting both large and small businesses during a time when they really needed it. And there could have been more activity if we had a stronger incentive. Several times a month, my office in the state film office receive calls from studio executives and producers looking to bring their projects to Maryland. Unfortunately, we continue to tell them that the $12 million program is closed because the annual credits have all been allotted. And that's a shame because Maryland is losing millions of dollars of economic impact, the revenue for small businesses and jobs that a robust film industry brings. Maryland recently lost Manhunt, a miniseries that would have filmed in Prince George's County, among other locations throughout the state. FX's Kindred, the IMDb series Sprung, which wanted to shoot in Frostburg, and Netflix's Rustin, all because the incentive program was tapped out. Just uh, Manhunt and Kindred went to Georgia, Sprung and Rustin went to Pennsylvania. We got a call yesterday from Disney FX, and they have a series they want to bring to Maryland and were inquiring about available tax credits. This program works. According to the Maryland Department of Commerce, from 2011 to 2022, the projected economic impact of the film industry in Maryland was over $1 billion, hiring over 20,000 Marylanders and supporting over 18,000 Maryland businesses. This program pays for itself, according to respected economists from the region. Dorothy, I'm going to have to ask you to please wrap up. Oh, I'm trying. I know, I <laughs> know. It. Um, we're in a position to grow this industry, and House Bill 432 will do just that. So we respectfully ask that this committee continue to work with us to grow this industry and pass House Bill 432 at the level introduced. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Next, John Favaza. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is John Favaza. I work with Manis Canning, and I'm here today on behalf of the Motion Picture Association. First, we'd like to thank Delegate Wells for, for introducing this legislation. Maryland and other jurisdictions, they just really continue to face stiff competition, both, both here in the U.S. and abroad, um, in terms of locating film and television productions. This isn't a new issue for the committee. And the reason it keeps coming back is this in competition, is this competition. In the last year alone, 18 states have either increased or extended their production incentive. And they're continuing to do it for the reasons that you, you've already heard. I mean, states recognize that these incentives um, provide a much needed economic stimulus to create these product, production jobs for their citizens while simultaneously developing, you know, infrastructure investment and further development. Something that I, I haven't mentioned in prior years on this bill that's really changed the dynamic of the industry is streaming. Um, we are in an age right now where there are over 500 scripted streaming productions right now. Many states find themselves at production capacity. So if this credit, credit can get enhanced, it, it's, it's a very critical time to try to entice these types of productions to Maryland. As I've stated in prior years, Maryland is well known 
in the industry for its skilled and talented local TV and film production workforce. Companies know this. They know that they're going to get a first-class team on the ground if they bring a production to Maryland. But in the cur current economic climate, production costs continue to be a very critical factor in location decision-making process. Finally, I just want to thank all of you for your work on these issues in prior years, and we encourage a favorable report. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next, Keith Mellinger, please, for two minutes. Hello, Keith Mellinger. I'm the director of the Screenwriting and Animation Program at Morgan State University. And um, thank you for letting me speak today, Chair. And um, like Delegate Wells, I'm a native of California, Pasadena, California, where I grew up with African Americans who were in show business and had union jobs and were actors and directors. But I've been in Baltimore for 24 years. And I'm the founding director of the Screenwriting and Animation Program. And this has been the best year ever this past year for work for our students on major productions and on independent productions. And it was a collision of tax incentives and historical initiatives in the business to include more African-Americans in film and motion pictures. The possibilities are fantastic. So I'm here to advocate for a new generation of filmmakers that we have forthcoming from Morgan State University that are now establishing beachheads on the East Coast in New York and on the West Coast in Los Angeles. But all roads lead from Baltimore. This is where they had their first opportunities to work on professional productions. And with more incentive money, we increase the possibilities of them having these kinds of opportunities continue to evolve. Thank you. I hope I haven't exceeded my two minutes. <laughs> no, you haven't. You got 30 seconds to say. Oh, I got 30 seconds left. Oh, oh gosh, I'm going to take it. Look, <laughs> we need to get this done. Okay. Um, among the part of part of the problem is as getting enough opportunities through tier one productions, meaning productions that come in that are independent with low budget, for instance, where my students can take on a number of jobs. For instance, we just worked on the Lifetime movie Safe Room. We worked on Spook Who Sat by the Door for Showtime this year. We worked on Show Me, a, um, not Show Me a Hero. We worked on We Own the City. But the tier one production was Life Space with a $2 million production. And I actually had students who did storyboarding, who did lighting. This is the road, the pathway into the union. And the union has been more accessible and friendly to bringing us into the larger productions now than Thank ever you. before. Two minutes up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Next, Catherine Clavana, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and distinguished committee members. I'm Catherine Clavana, a full-time actor and current president of the Washington Mid-Atlantic Local of SAG-AFTRA, the Union of Professional Performers. On behalf of our 5,000 local members, I speak in favor of HB 432. Why? because films equal jobs. A film or television production generates work for thousands of people who live here. Yes, that means jobs for local actors, but also crew to build the sets, move the gear and transport the cast. It means hotel rooms, rental cars, catering and security details. HBO's Veep generated over $165 million worth of impact on our economy while it was here. Think of what this proposed increase to our tax incentive program could do for our state. Film makes a, a huge difference in our members' lives. A Baltimore actor told me she was able to qualify for health insurance for the first time in several years because of the months of work she did as a stand-in on HBO's We Own This City. For actors working on a film or television production as a principal performer, even for a day, results in a nice credit, good pay, and residual payments for years to come. That's money in our pocket that continues to grow and an ongoing tax revenue stream for Maryland. The pandemic has had a devastating effect on so many businesses. Last year, my husband had to close his business in Hyattsville building theatrical scenery and lay off his nine full-time IATSE employees. These are expert scenic carpenters who could find good paying jobs with union benefits if our film industry grows and thrives. Raising the amount of annual tax credits for film production in Maryland will do so much. It'll allow more than one major production at a time to film here, encourage new investments in infrastructure, give students a path to pursue, 
and add marketing power to our travel and tourism initiatives. On behalf of the creative community here in Maryland, I urge a favorable report on HB 432. Thank you. Thank you. Next, David O'Farrell, please. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and the rest of the committee. My name is David O'Farrell. I'm the business agent for the Mid-Atlantic Studio Mechanics and Broadcast Technicians, and I'm representing the technicians who are integral to bringing motion picture and television productions to life here in Maryland. The current program has shown it can be successful, and we need to build on that success, and this bill goes a long way to make that happen. The crew and talent here in Maryland have established themselves as amongst the best in the world. Productions now hire the majority of their crews locally. They're no longer bringing in as many people as they used to years ago. Any given production creates hundreds of jobs, not just for crew, but for talent, for teamsters, for production staff. Uh, a single production, uh, We Own This City, meant over $8 million in total compensation paid just to my members as well as $2 million in health and retirement benefits that they wouldn't have otherwise had unless those shows had been here. The biggest problem we're running into these days is the fact the te technicians are so good, they're being asked to go work elsewhere. We've had technicians in Massachusetts, in Pennsylvania, in Georgia, in the Carolinas, in New Mexico, and California. This isn't about supporting corporations or celebrities. This is about supporting the working men and women of Maryland who rely on the motion picture and television industry. We're working hard to increase opportunities through our DEI initiatives and working with the schools and programs in the state to get more people, more work. These are not part-time jobs, these are careers. So we ask that you give a favorable report to House Bill 432 and support an industry that gets good jobs here in Maryland. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Sig Leibowitz, please. Hello? We can hear you. Uh, oh, great. Hi there, everyone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, and I want to thank Delegate Wells for bringing forth this very important legislation. Uh, I'm here in favor uh, and hope that you will support House Bill 432. Um, I, uh, my name is Sig Libowitz. I was born and raised here in Baltimore uh, and then um, spent many years out in New York and Los Angeles working as a studio executive, a producer, and a writer. Uh, I came back for family and because I believe in film and television here in Maryland. I work here as a producer and writer. I'm also on the faculty of Towson and guest lecturer at Hopkins and at Stevenson. Um, and I see many students who are really talented and are looking for opportunities um, to grow their craft and stay here in Maryland. And this bill would grant them that support. Um, while I've been back, I wrote and produced a short film that was shortlisted for an Academy Award, filmed entirely here in Maryland. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, I then had a feature film that I was producing starring two Academy Award dominated actors who unfortunately we couldn't shoot the film, which we were planning to do in Annapolis because of the lack of credits. Um, and that was very painful. Uh, the writer and director is also from Maryland and you know, the hope was to do it here. And that was impossible. Uh, I can though say that fortunately we were able to later shoot a, a web series for television here uh, because of the, um, because of the credits, because of the incentive. Um, and again, I wanna say this is, as you know, this is a film production activity tax credit. That's so important, I stress those words, production activity. Um, unlike the other bills that were mentioned here, uh, talking about, you know, if I, uh, to quote, corporate avoidance or withholding, this is the exact opposite. None of the money is released until after the production has filmed here in Maryland and shown that everything is qualified, they show the receipts, and Maryland gets a chance to audit these records and verify that the money is spent here in Maryland. And this creates a pipeline for my students and for Maryland filmmakers to, to make films, both larger films and smaller, you know, Maryland um, productions like, uh, like my latest one was. This is an incredible opportunity uh, for the state. I'm happy to answer any questions. And I want to thank you so much, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of my students at the state universities and encouraging them to continue to stay here in Maryland rather than take thank you. opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Aaron Skulka, please, for two minutes. 
You're on mute, Mr. Skalka. Sorry, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys having me. I'm here uh, both as a uh, crew member, a department head, and also as the owner of a business that supports film and television activities, both here in Maryland and in about five other states. And I'm here to just tell you simply that uh, these incentive plans work. Um, the current incentive has helped keep a lot of projects here that would have gone elsewhere. Uh, the lack of uh, further incentives has turned away uh, stuff as the film office has told you. Uh, I talk to people in LA and New York constantly about equipment uh, and it's it's a consistent problem where I say, hey, you know, have you ever thought about coming to Baltimore? And that's selfish because I live here. I'm born and raised in Maryland. Uh, and they all say the same thing. Yeah, the numbers just don't pencil out. Once that incentive is gone, there's no reason for us to come there. And that's a shame. Um, the shows that do come here do very well. I was fortunate enough to work on We Own This City this past summer. The side benefit to all of these things, whether you're approaching it from the one side of the aisle, which looks at it from a business point of view, or the other side of the aisle that looks at it maybe from a labor point of view, the, the thing that often gets overlooked is, especially on a project like We Own This City, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that were spent in historically disenfranchised communities in Baltimore. Um, people who would never have had an opportunity to have high paying jobs like that were given that to expand their careers. These incentives work. Um, I can tell you, we send equipment all over the world. We only send them to states that have incentives that are robust and sustainable. And what we have is a great start. This, uh, uh, this will help bolster that and continue on in what Maryland has to offer. And I think it's a, there's very little downside to the state of Maryland, if any at all. And I urge you all to uh, report favorably on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, Lorenzo Milan, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me come on. Uh, I'm a production sound mixer uh, for the better part of 30 years here in um, in Baltimore, I'm born in Baltimore City. I live in Baltimore County. I've been a part of uh, productions like Homicide, Life, uh, Life on the Street, The Wire, House of Cards, We Own the City. And I think what's important that's not have, that hasn't really been talked about, we talk about the business aspect, is the fact that all of us crew that live here, we spend our money here. We hire local businesses. We spend our, you know, so you, you almost have double taxes. You know, double, you know, I pay my state taxes and then I, pay a company to put my fence, my fence up or do siding on my house. And I think what's, I think that's a very important aspect. And the other part is um, we've had down, downturns when losing incentives. And after homicide ended, we lost a tremendous amount of crew. After the wire ended, we lost a tremendous amount of crew. After House of, Card end, House of Cards ended, we lost a tremendous amount of crew. We have a very talented crew base here that we keep on losing because we can't hold them. And one show is not always good enough for us to hold enough people. And so we end up losing it and then we lose the incentives or they go down and then we lose crew and then we have to struggle all over again. And I, I've been in front of this committee before and spoken about this before. I love my state and I want to work here and I want to stay here. I've been forced to go work out of state because I can't make a living here sometimes. You know, my son has a pre-existing medical condition. I get to go to Johns Hopkins University, the best hospital in the country. Um, I want to stay. I don't want to leave. You know, nobody does. We're all Marylanders. We all want to work here. Um, and that's more the personal aspect that I wanted to give. Uh, I've been tremendously successful. Uh, I won an Emmy for my work on House of Cards. Uh, I, I'm very happy and very proud of that and very proud to say that I'm from the state of Maryland. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Christopher Dews, please, for two minutes. Wonderful. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Christopher Dews, and I'm the Senior Policy Advocate of the Job Opportunities Task Force in one life, and I'm also a performer in the DMV in another. I personally support House Bill 432 as a means of attracting film, commercial, and television production to the state and increasing access to employment to Maryland's talented pool of performers, as you've already heard from already. It does pain me to say that the average actor, and trust me, I know this well, in the state of Maryland mits, nets an annual income of around $20,000 from the industry, way less than what is needed in, uh, to live on in most areas 
percentage of the state. The average SAG actor nationally is paid about 52,000. As such, many actors in the state are gig workers working a variety of survival jobs, some would even say in the public policy industry, to be able to maintain the pursuit of the career that many were trained for. Most actors will admit that the cash cow or golden goose in the acting industry is booking a film, television, or commercial gig. So of course, bringing more jobs into the state for the statistically lower income populace is vital, not just uh, for myself, of course, or for other actors in the industry, but also for those uh, you know who, who support workforce development, for those who support economic opportunities in the state of Maryland. Maryland specifically is a beautiful state. From a film perspective, it has a lot of locales, beaches, cities, forests, lakes, mountains, military bases, and more, which makes us very competitive when it comes to the production of film and television. As has already been mentioned, we did drop our tax credits from 25 million to 7.5 million from, 20, from 2014 to 2015. And we have seen a massive reduction in a movement when it comes to the industry throughout the state. And so many of my colleagues, when I was younger, we were all performers and many of them have now gone on to other states where in which Maryland could not have lost that talent. I am born and raised in Maryland, Prince George's County, Howard County. I want to, I love this state. I want to stay in it and I want to see more uh, productions happen here so that we can keep that money in the state and more opportunities for all Maryland workers. I thank you all for your time. Thank you. And Mr. Dews, I could totally see that in you as, as being an actor. I saw him a lot in my former committee. And each time you testify in the former committee, you should have led that you were raised in Howard County. So. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any questions? Delegate Guyton. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the testimony that we've heard today and the bill being brought forth to us from Delegate Wells. Um, I also want to recognize that I have more than one, several constituents who have testified to you today, and it's lovely to see all of you. Um, I have one question that Mr. Dew spoke to briefly. But I do know that uh, I have a lot of friends who are creative through in the art world. They're gig workers. They do a lot of theater and performance. And it seemed like anecdotally, both from them and from some constituents who contacted me over the past 18 months, that they were particularly hard hit by the COVID pandemic. And uh, you haven't really spoken to that. And I, I guess I, I would like to know, you know how or whether that is true and, and how or whether this incentive might help uh, that particular sector of performers move towards recovery. I can speak to that very quickly and then pass it over to the other members of the panel. I will say uh, personally, yeah, the, a lot of gigs just shut down. And so if you were in the film industry full time, uh, you know, the world shut down. So the idea of, of moving, uh, you know, trying to be in, in large conglomerate specifically when it comes to uh, getting work as a background extra or things of that nature were totally amiss. So I will, I mean, I had shifted industries at the time, so it didn't really hit me as hard as it hit most other performers, but many people dropped out of the industry altogether or tried to find an alternative means of making life happen for themselves. So yes, bringing this tax credit specifically to the state of Maryland would access, would open a wide door of access for those workers who kind of had to drop out, you know, so that they could survive. And so I, I think this would be a massive boon, but I will pass that question over to other members of the panel. Delegate, Delegate Guyton, do you have another question? Oh. I can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you. No, I appreciate that answer. And uh, that's consistent with what I've also heard and, and what my constituents have said. And I do want to point out that I really appreciate Mr. Milan in the past bringing his Emmy to Annapolis and letting me hold it. That was a highlight. So thank you. Delegate Buckle. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, uh, one of the witnesses mentioned Sprung that was supposed to come to Frostburg. I was pretty involved uh, last year with some of those discussions because I don't know if you've ever watched the television show years ago. My name is Earl. The actual producer of that show, a guy named Greg Garcia, is a Frostburg State University alumnus who continually would like to bring productions back into the Western Maryland area in Frostburg where he went to college. But one of the concerns, you know, we've heard this bill many times. I've been on this committee, I think, eight years now. I think this is probably the third, fourth, maybe fifth iteration uh, of the film tax credit bill that we've heard. And one of the problems I always had with it is, is the size in relationship to our other, maybe this is a question for Delegate Wells. You know, my recollection is our biotechnology and cybersecurity tax credit programs combined don't add up to $50 million dollars. And so I think it's, it's, you know, it's not credible to say that the film industry, 
is a bigger industry employing more people and generating more money and more revenue and, and you know, bettering the lives of Marylanders more than biotechnology and cybersecurity, which were a, a national or regional leader in both. And so that was always kind of the concern of how do you justify this credit being so big and yet for other corporations, for other job creators who maybe it's not as cool, it's, it's probably not as cool to work as a biotech assistant in, in Montgomery County in a lab is what it is to work on a film production crew for We Own This City. But, you know, th- those people have jobs here, too, and, and they're doing all the same things these folks are saying. How, how, do, how do we justify getting to $50 million for this one industry specific credit? Sure. I'll take, I'll kind of take a stab. And I think um, there may be some others on the panel, like um, perhaps Sig or um, Aaron Skolka that might add more con that that could add more to it. I think that, um, so that's definitely a well-received question. And and you're right. I think the optics of it, right. Is when you look at the actual price tag, I do believe um, that what is diff, which may be different and perhaps I'm not, so I'm happy to be educated on this, but we are talking about a rebate program as well. And um, if this is something that is paid once someone is, once it's applied to, um, I think also you have to as well look at the nature of the industry as well, where we know that uh, if we do believe that uh, we want to continue to put money into this tax credit and we want to continue to be viable and those investments uh, be viable investments in yielding the jobs and tax revenue, we do need to increase the amount of money that we're putting towards it. Um, so, you know, there could still be a philosophical difference between us on this delegate buckle, but I do believe that the nature of how this this program works and I think that if we are deciding that we still believe this is worth our money um, and value, that we do have to find a way to increase some of it. Um, I don't know if 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 um, Sig is still on or yes, if- I, I am. Okay. Please. I am, and, and thank you very much, Delegate Wells. And what you said is actually quite on point. The idea that this is a rebate program it works so differently from other incentive programs. I'd actually love to no longer call it an incentive because it really is a rebate. And like I talked about, it's for production activity. So how it differs is fundamental um, to what it brings to the state in terms of economic activity and jobs, which is all, which is this, the amount of money that Maryland has to pay out at the beginning is zero, nothing. The only thing that happens as a rebate is the production has to come into the state, fully actually spend the money in Maryland, and, and only on qualified expenses. So none of this money can go to high paid actors or to producers or directors at all. Everything has to be qualified and it has to be itemized and has to be proven to the state. Only after the production shoots here completely, they have to provide detailed records and receipts. And then, which is very different from other states, Maryland has the opportunity to audit everything that's been spent to, to verify, right? The famous uh, trust but verify. Um, the, the, the state has the opportunity to verify that every single penny has been spent only on qualified expenses here in the state of Maryland. And I can tell you just again, recently going through this on a small Maryland production where I wanna again, point out the fact that we hired several students from the Baltimore School for the Arts, from Towson, uh, from Hopkins, you know, to be part of that and to learn and to make money. Um, only then does any rebate money go back to uh, the production. So in all that time, Maryland is able to gain from the production and everything that happens there. And it really, I think, is a striking difference from every other type of uh, house bill that's come up before or other types of incentives. Well, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't want to quibble with that, but I was this is a refundable tax credit. So, right. so the, the company has to have a tax liability in Maryland the company applies for this. Not, not all these wonderful individuals that testify and say, this provides my job. Like, they don't get any direct tax credit. It's the company, HBO, whomever it may be. So they have to have a tax liability in Maryland. They apply, and then the credit is refundable, which means that they're, they're getting money. I mean, we are paying money. It's not just, hey, we're just giving them their tax revenues back. We're actually subsidizing uh, all of their costs, not all of their costs, but we're subsidizing a chunk of their costs in the program. And that's why I say, you know, I, I just, I, I only have one or two other questions, I guess. Uh, for those of you who worked, I heard a lot of talk about, we own this city. Uh, I can tell you uh, that that's, that was the, the decision. I don't know, Delegate Wells, if you're familiar with this, 
Do you have any concerns about the administration of the program, meaning it seems to be almost a first come first serve program? And so what what tends to happen is one television show or one movie applies. And if they happen to be first in the queue to get everything done, they they eat the credit. The reason why there were no credits for Sprung to come to Frostburg is because we had spent all the credits or committed the credits, essentially almost all the credits to we own this city in Baltimore. And one of the concerns I have is all of you, you know, that have said about these shows, I watch TV too. You know, I think shows like The Wire and Homicide and We Own This City, they're all pretty much based in Baltimore. Baltimore seems to be not 100%, but they seem to be the locus of most of these uh, credits. So the question, how many months a year does someone work on the production of We Own This City? So if you're these various people that, you know, that work there and and they're, they're involved in set production, technical production, acting, whatever it may be, how many days a year is We Own This City actually operating in the state of Maryland? Does anybody have a rough idea of that? Uh, I see Aaron Skalkla. Hi, uh, to answer your question, sir, I was on that show for uh, nine and a half months. Um, My company also provided equipment on that for almost a year, uh, generating almost a million dollars in revenue for us here in Maryland directly. So is that that then, I mean, it's a television show. Is that going to be a yearly thing with nine and a half months out of every year, a year, out, you know, basically around the clock, we're continuing to work on that show or I've never worked on a TV show in my entire life. I like Yellowstone a lot and Yellowstone only comes on like every year and a half. So I don't know if it takes them nine and a half months to film it uh, sure. or, or what's going on. Yeah, I, I think that that depends on the kind of show you're attracting and it depends very much. It's a little bit of a, a lottery there uh, who shows up here and who doesn't uh, what who's in line for the credit and who wants to film here. So I think year over year, Maryland tends to attract um, renewable shows, House of Cards, Veep, The Wire, things like that. And with a more robust credit, you'd be able to ensure them that season after season, they could come back and you don't have another Veep where they're gonna go, they're gonna follow the credit, um, which is what Veep did, right? They went to California there to follow the credit. So I think uh, your, your, your concern is, is well-founded that if it's a first come first serve, it's a little bit harder for the state to justify uh, going after all kinds of different things. Maryland, in terms of it being Baltimore centric, yes, those stories are Baltimore centric, but you also have a lot of the um, crew based here. You also have a lot of the infrastructure. Uh, Most of the times uh, film and production, television productions need um, the, the things that Baltimore provides. That's not to say that Frostburg couldn't have done it. They certainly, that, that show was easily doable out there. But I think what this does by shoring up these credits is it allows a, a bigger variety of things to come here. And it allows producers who want long-term commitments, multiple seasons of television or a bigger feature, a, a, a Marvel type feature. I work a lot in Georgia where that incentive right. attracts that kind of stuff. Right. And so, that's a conversation that we've had in the committee before is a way to maybe turn it into a, my understanding, at least in Georgia, is that they've created this almost permanent infrastructure. These for sure. sets, these, these graphic components that are there year round. Uh, And so it's an industry as opposed to just, hey, we're doing some work for three months, six months, nine months on a show, it may or may go. In Georgia, it's we've incentivized a permanent industry, almost like the Southern California was for the films and movies of the 1930s and 40s. Yeah, sure, without a doubt. And my company, just as a tiny little company, our, the focus of our infrastructure for the last five years was Georgia because we had these customers that were there long term. And so that's why we employ a dozen people in Georgia and have bigger facilities and all that stuff. That can all happen in Maryland. This is a, this, these are all baby steps to a much more robust program if that's what the legislature decides they want to do. But in the short term, even this kind of incentive is great on a small scale and start small. And if it, if it is to your liking, then you can grow it. But this is a great step along the way that doesn't really harm the state. Um, and just to go back to what you were saying about these tax credits, you're, you're absolutely right. Until you look at the, the knock-on effect of the money that's being spent here. So yes, you are in some ways in a vacuum subsidizing HBO or Disney or whoever it is. But when you look at me and you say, well, but that company, that tiny little spec is buying trucks, employing people, 
what we, you know what, you would like to have just back what we spend with the MVA every year. So uh, sure. and all, all my, all my democratic friends on the committee know that, you know, nobody likes tax credits better than what I do. Uh, you know, I, I get it. I, I, I enjoy letting people, uh, you know, the private sector get the benefit of that. Well, and then I you're really a snow leopard of a politician. It's, you're right down the middle. It's, they're it's, doing it's far very, between. Very informational and instructive. I really appreciate your, uh, your comments. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. If I could just add something very quickly um, to, to your point, um, the web series that I did, we shot it in Howard County and House of Cards and Veep were not centered in Baltimore. They shot in different parts of the state. Um, and so I think other parts of the state do benefit. And again, the hope would be with expanding um, this program would allow for more to happen here. It would happen in other places than simply in Baltimore. What was the web series in Howard County? Uh, it was, it's called Turf Valley. Um, and, and oh, well, uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And it's said right there, you know, we're promoting uh, Turf Valley and the resort there. So there you go. It's a win, win, win. Okay. Well, uh, we hope you enjoyed it in Howard County. I read part of Howard County and one of the main stars in Veep trashed Columbia, which was named by Money Magazine, one of the best places to live. So didn't appreciate her comments on that. But Delegate Lasanti. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Delegate Wells, thanks for bringing this, um, this important um, bill to us. Um, I want to talk about the, uh, the economic impact. Because um, when I'm looking at the fiscal impact, and, and, and I know that our fiscal notes have a shortcoming in that they, they really don't capture return on investment. Um, and in my previous life as a city manager and as a county councilwoman, when we, attract, when we use these tax credits to attract um, this industry to our county and to the city, we had a huge um, small business impact as well as to our own, um, to our own tax base. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that, because um, I think that that might be the missing element that helps to um, balance the investment in developing an industry and what the impact is. Absolutely. So um, for, so the kind of broad, broad strokes um, return on investment is for every $1, it's a return of $3.64. If you start to dig a little deeper, um, and I think, um, Ms. Dorsey, she really helped us elaborate on this in co previous conversations, but also I think in terms of production, local taxes, the local tax revenue generation is around $250,000 $250, a day during production, I believe is, is my understanding of that. Um, but I'm happy to let the experts that do this day in, day out, run the numbers all the time to add context, but definitely delicate Lasanti, there, there are significant impacts to revenue generation um, for each dollar as well as for small businesses. And I think that we are a state that really prides ourselves on supporting small businesses, um, whether it's, you know, the, the food sector. My understanding is that even during COVID, when a lot of restaurants and, um, and, and eateries weren't able to be open to the public, many of them were, um, were catering to productions, you know, that were happening, right? So uh, that piece, I think we heard just, we just heard um, the previous question around transportation. So there is a significant local revenue mm -hmm. as well as a state revenue generation impact from this legislation and i think the other piece is that the, the um the uh fiscal note also doesn't really fully encap like in capture the impact of the jobs because there's a market for individuals here doing this work. They may not be working on a, a show production, but another market is the commercial sector. And so we do have other production that takes place that may not be utilizing these credits, but are providing jobs and sustainability over um, over a year or over time for, for workers in this and, industry. And with that being said, uh, being of concentrating it in Maryland, because we have so many states and in, in, in accessible to us, and such a variety of uh, of places where you where the film industry and all the uh, the can can reproduce things. It seems like that we that we become the the central location where uh, where we can take advantage of what's going on in other states around us. Is that what you're finding? I think so. I I think you know just geographically, we know that we have similar infrastructure and architecture and geography. That you know we have the beach, we have the mountains, we have rural areas, we have dense urban areas. We're not far from you know we're still not too far to get to Georgia, where other production takes place, or Philadelphia, New York. I mean we're we're in a we're in a corridor, a crossroads. Uh, yeah, opportunity. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Delegate Lukey. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, like like Delegate Buckle, who has a, a great face for radio, I have never been on a, 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 a movie or TV show of any kind. But um, my understanding of the industry, and I, I just want to confirm this, is unlike the other tax credit programs that we have, um, where with Amazon, for example, when states were competing for the location for the new Amazon headquarters, the tax credits were not the only thing Amazon was looking at. There were other factors. So part of the, the question for states was, is it worth essentially giving away potential tax revenue for a business that might still locate here? But have we in recent years had any big movie or TV show productions that located in the state without use of the credits? In other words, isn't it kind of the state of the industry that you don't get these big productions unless you have adequate incentives in place? Um, Madam Chair, if I may, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, we wouldn't get these productions if not for the incentive. We're surrounded by states that have much more in their programs than, than we do. Um, so, you know, yet we have to have this in order for it to be an industry. You know, uh, Delegate Buckle mentioned subsidizing the HBOs, but what they're really subsidizing are jobs that wouldn't be here, spends that wouldn't be here. Uh, I, I remind the committee that in this bill, it is a $10 million cap per production. So if this were to go up uh, to 25 or 50, that would mean multiple productions uh, would be eligible. And that, that 10 million represents a $40 million spend, qualified spend within the state of Maryland. That's not based on anything they do in California, anything they do in New York, anything they do anywhere else in the country. Uh, and that's money that's spent with local businesses, our construction crews buying lumber, paint, our set dressing crews buying furniture, carpeting, drapery. Um, so a lot goes into uh, the state based on these productions versus what goes out. Thank and, you. And then Mr. O'Farrell, on, on the other side of the equation, if we increase this and productions don't end up locating here, the state's not out any money, right? Like we don't lose anything. No, sir, not a, not a single dime. It, it only goes out once it's been spent here and been thoroughly audited by the Department of Commerce uh, on, and it's only based on qualified Maryland spends. So uh, again, it was mentioned earlier, this isn't on big actor salaries. This isn't on uh, spends they do outside the state or if they only do part of it here. Uh, it's only on qualified spends here, and that money is being spent with crews, with businesses uh, here in Maryland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 432. Moving on to our final bill of the day, Delegate Jones, House Bill 386. And there are about six uh, folks signed up to testify. So whenever you're ready, Delegate Jones, you can begin. Thank you so much, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Washington, and fellow members of the Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I am Delegate Dana Jones. I come before you today to testify on HB 386, a bill to streamline the process for local governments to issue grant funding to businesses and nonprofits impacted by natural disasters. This legislation builds upon HB 853, which unanimously passed last session. 853 expanded the use of small minority and women-owned businesses account to provide grants to businesses affected by federal disaster areas or through a federal or state declaration of emergency. The expansion of the program helped get essential relief to many small businesses when the small minority and women-owned business was utilized this October in response to historic flooding that hit coastal communities throughout the state and greatly impacted my district. The governmental response to the flood was quick and effective. Governor Hogan declared a state of emergency on October 29th, the same day the flood began. Because of this, de his, this declaration, the very next day, County Executive Pittman announced that Anne Arundel Economic Development Corporation would immediately be accepting applications for grants up to 50,000 for businesses impacted by the flood through the process outlined in 853. Within a matter of just weeks, 
Over a dozen grants were issued to help get our community's small businesses back on their feet. However, the critical need for this bill becomes clear when you consider the state's response to the most recent tornado that hit my district this past fall. On September 1st, 2021, a category EF2 tornado tore through the city of Annapolis and parts of Edgewater, leaving an immense amount of destruction in its path. Dozens, dozens of businesses sustained devastating damage, some completely destroyed. Unlike the response to the October floods, the governor did not declare a state of emergency and our state was unable then to receive FEMA disaster declaration. This meant that our businesses suffered for months without knowing whether or not their state was going to come through with desperately needed support. This legislation would fix the problem seen in the aftermath of the tornado by creating a process in which local SMWOB fund managers can issue grants in the case of a local emergency declaration rather than just in federal or state ones. The legislation matches HB 853 in that grants can only be up for up to 50,000 and it does also expand to nonprofits. If this legislation had been in law when the tornado hit, we would have been able to immediately distribute funding to businesses and nonprofits in the greater Annapolis area. I wanna mention how honored I am to have such leaders in my district here with me today to testify. I wanna thank my panel as well as all those who submitted testimony. I respectfully urge a favorable report on this legislation to allow our local governments to take quick and meaningful action after local emergencies. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. Thank you. And next, Preeti Emmerich, please, for two minutes. Thank you, and good afternoon to the chair and members of the committee. My name is Preeti Emmerich, and I'm the director of the Anne Arundel County Office of Emergency Management, testifying in support of this bill. So in emergency management, the basic premise is that all disasters start at the local level. So I will speak to the two local disasters that were mentioned that had different outcomes. The EF2 tornado that touched down in Anne Arundel County and the city of Annapolis on September 1st, 2021. With that, the county executive, Stuart Pittman, and Mayor Gavin Buckley both declared a local state of emergency on September 2nd, 2021. 25 businesses were impacted. The city's community and economic development divisions estimated that 3,854,580 million was lost from business revenue and destroyed inventory as a result of the event. On September 27, 2021, Governor Hogan asked FEMA for a major disaster declaration. And that was denied in a letter on October 8, 2021. And FEMA states in that letter, based on our review of all the information available, it has been determined that the damage from this event was not of such severity and magnitude as to be beyond the capabilities of the state and affected local governments. Without a state or federal declaration, the businesses could not benefit from the bulk funds to make repairs and prevent further economic loss and had to wait a month with no relief. Compare this to the coastal flooding storm that impacted the county and the city on October 29th, 2021. And as stated, Governor Hogan declared a state of emergency that very day. And several businesses were able to utilize the vault funding the very next day on October 30th which prevented further economic loss and allowed businesses to open doors quickly. FEMA does not fund small disasters. Disasters start at the local level. So let's give the locals the flexibility and authority to utilize the resources available at the state and avoid further hardship on our businesses and nonprofits. For all of these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Walter Vasquez, please, for two minutes. Hi there. Uh, my name, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, my name is Walter Vasquez. I'm um, a small business owner here in uh, Anne Arundel. I've been here for about 14 years. Um, we moved from Miami, so we have um, Businesses now, one of my business, which is a small Latino market, was affected by um, the tornado that day. 
uh, for uh, thank God that nobody got, no human being got hurt. But I do agree with the young lady here that we should have funding for this type of situation because they, are, they come unexpectedly. And it is very sad to see all the work that we put in and we can react as a community. And I'm very happy and proud to say that uh, the officials reacted the proper way. I have never seen that before. I saw from Gavin, uh, Pittman, Sarah, uh, Rhonda, but they did the right thing, but we need to be united as business owners and as members of this community. And we should have those funding ready because when we had this bureaucratic system, when somebody has to think and look at the paperwork and go around this and think by the time this is not an emergency, an emergency is supposed to be an immediate reaction by all of us. Not for those, the only one that be affected, but those who are in charge. And like I said, and I will say it again, the people that are in charge in the city, the county, everybody, they did the right thing, but we need the funding. And I think the state of Maryland, unfortunately, they don't have that. I had the opportunity to talk to Hogan. He was very polite, but at the end, he didn't deliver. And in these cases, that's what we need. Um, I really am asking you to try and encourage you to get this funding, to forget about all this bureaucratic paperwork and anything, just this, when a, a, a disaster like this come across, let's be prepared and let's react. Let's have a team ready to see what is exactly what people need. I'm coming from work. I'm sorry, I'm talking about part of my car because I work a lot. And um, now we are, <laughs> I work pretty much a lot. I own more businesses, I employ a lot of people. And thank God they were still working. Thank God that I was a little bit prepared financially, but Otherwise, I would have like seven families without work. Besides that, we already have a COVID. We have this difficult illness that's killing us. Now we're going to have people outside without having work. So Thank let's you, be, Mr. Vasquez, can you wrap up, please? Yes, I just I want to ask everybody to let's get together. And let's see if we can ask this. We have some money ready for those uh, moments that we the disaster that we're going to face. Thank you. Next, Brianna January, please, for two minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, esteemed committee members. It's good to be before the committee again. Uh, for the record, my name is Brianna January, and I am representing the Maryland Association of Counties, also known as MACO, here to testify in strong support of HB 386. You've heard what the bill does, so I won't repeat and I'll be brief, uh, but I do think it's important to express county support for this important bill. Counties do their best to provide operational and fiscal assistance to businesses and nonprofits impacted during trying times of local emergencies as such as those already exampled. Um, but committee, the reality is that the needs are often much greater than local resources available. And so HB 386 seeks to fill some of those gaps by extending state resources to those local businesses and nonprofits, um, very important pieces of our community infrastructure that are impacted during uh, difficult situations. As always, counties stand ready to partner with the state to meet the many challenges of local emergencies and County CHB 386 as another example of possible collaboration to do so. So for these reasons, uh, Mako thanks Delegate Jones for introducing the bill and urges a favorable report from the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Donna Whitaker, please, for two minutes. Donna Whitaker in the room. Okay. Next, then Rhonda Pendle Charles, please, for two minutes. Madam Chair, Ways and Men's Committee, distinguished state legislators, good afternoon. My name is Rhonda Pendle Charles. I serve on the Annapolis City Council representing Ward 3, and I am an attorney. I have lived in Annapolis, specifically the parole community, all of my 67 years, and my family has had a presence here in parole since the Civil War. I'm here to testify in support of House Bill 386. As you may be aware, again, on September 1st, 2021, our community suffered a devastating event, namely Tornado Ida, ripped through our neighborhoods. While as a result, we were blessed not to have suffered any loss of life or injuries, nevertheless, nothing of this magnitude has ever happened here. So for us, it has been a traumatic event 
with unimaginable experiences, including navigating the systems, especially since again, our parole community is an older community. Not only have close to 100 private households been directly affected, suffering a variety of losses, approximately 30 businesses, including nonprofits, have been affected as well, anywhere from being a total loss to the loss of electricity and everything else in between, directly affecting their ability to do business and to stay in business. And we are still reeling from this event. While we remain very grateful for the support of our city, county, state, the governor's office, and private organizations, nevertheless, a more streamlined process would have been very helpful. And this bill addresses many challenges. House Bill 386 would authorize local fund managers to distribute funds after local emergencies rather than, under, rather than only under state emergencies as they are currently authorized. This would lead to less bureaucracy and dollars would reach the hands of businesses and nonprofits more quickly. Therefore, we wholeheartedly support this legislation. Thank you so very much for your thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Uh, there are two questions. I see Delegate Lukey and then Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not, not a question. I just want to make the committee aware on our floor system and the list of testimony on this bill. The Comptroller's office testimony is listed as unfavorable. That's that's an error. They are favorable on the bill and the, the letter, if you read it, says they support it. Thank you. Delegate Thank you. Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, great, great bill here, Delegate Jones. Um, we often <clears throat> associate small women and minority-owned business accounts with minority and women, but this is for for ge more generally any small business in this case, right? That would that that has ownership in the state. Thank you so much for that question. No, it absolutely uh, it's small businesses. Uh, yes, so um, they actually defer to the Federal Small Business Administration's definition of small businesses. So, for example, um, with the tornado, every single business that was affected. Um, would have fallen under this. So it is small businesses. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for that question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 386. Thank you, committee members. Just sit tight for 